We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, call to order this regular meeting of the City Council, Tuesday, October 15th. Roll call. Okay. Sorry. Mayor Brinkman? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stallman? Here. Councilmember Beckman? Here. Councilmember Shenanig? Present. Councilmember Cole? Here. Councilmember Taylor? Councilmember Valdez? I am here. Okay, will you please stand for the pledge? Okay, um, are there any changes to the agenda? City Manager? Yes, Mayor, thank you. Um, on the uh, executive session, uh, staff has um, continued to discuss uh, item A, which is the um, going into executive session for purposes of uh, discussion, purchase, acquisition, lease, uh, transfer, sale of real property regarding uh, Colorado State Land Board property, and we um, would respectfully request that that be removed from the agenda. We'll bring it back to council um, at a further time. We're continuing to uh, work with them at this time. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure Jerry's all in. Less is more. Why, right? Okay, any other? <laughs> Jerry's you want, good. You sure? <laughs> any other changes? Okay, seeing none, we'll approve the agenda with change. Uh, minutes from the regular session of October 1st, 2013. Any changes? I've Previous given. comments were given to Wendy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same. I've given mine there to Wendy. Okay. Those are approved. Um, citizen appearances. We have no one signed up for guest or scheduled. On unscheduled public appearances, this is an opportunity for any citizen to express an opinion, ask a question regarding city services, council policies, or other matters of community concern that are not part of the scheduled agenda. Generally, an immediate response should not be expected. Typically, issues are referred to the city staff for follow-up and information or research, um, and then reported back to council and the individual that initiated the comment or the inquiry. We do have, on this evening's agenda, we do have a number of public hearings, items 7A, B, C, and D. So if you would like to speak on any of those, please wait until those public hearings. Is there anyone who wanted to come down this evening? Yes. And please state your name and your address, and you have four minutes. Hello, Council. My name is Joycelyn Strait, and I live at 791 West Prentice Avenue. And I'm here to talk about the two citizen initiatives that got on the ballot and the process and, um, my, uh, and not being able to know about these initiatives until quite late in the process and some suggestions Can about maybe... Can you hold maybe. on a moment? Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> Mayor, members of Council, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, not having been here for a long time, I'm not sure how Council has done this in the past, but it has always been my practice in other communities I've worked in under the um, uh, Colorado campaign laws Cities are not allowed to use public resources uh, to either support or oppose measures on the ballots. And um, I have interpreted that as a number of my city attorney colleagues to preclude um, televised meetings from having uh, anyone take positions either for or against candidates or for or against issues on the ballot because it's using <clears throat> public resources to support one position or the other. Um, I have no idea what the, um, the citizen is going to say either for or against, so this has nothing to do with the substance of it, but simply my advice to you would be to not permit um, political statements for issues or candidates that are on the ballot to be made during televised um, Littleton Council meetings. Thank you. All right, so if this you can is not keep your that, comments. No, this is strictly about the process. Okay. All right, so um, the way I found out about it was through the newspaper, the initiative, and uh, I could so then I went immediately to your website and tried to find anything about it. And I looked under news announcements, the election um, site, couldn't find anything. So I did end up calling the city clerk's office and in, in uh, about three and a half weeks ago, and uh, was told that they were looking at getting um, someone's opposition wording ready so that they could put it on the website. 
I'm not sure how that fits in, but I was expecting to see that um, as the city clerk said that they were looking to, to have that put up. And so um, nothing came and nothing came, but I did start to see information about the candidates, um, uh, the, the requirements that they were supposed to put um, down their, their funding and, and a video statement. And what, what there was was the city clerk um, introducing the names of the candidate on video, the names of the three ordinances that you have proposed and are on the ballot, the two subject matters of the initiative, and then there were video statements from each of the candidates. Um, but there was nothing for the initiatives. And just, I'm not talking pro or con, just being able to be up there and have them and make a video statement as far as equal timing. So that's the first issue. I don't know exactly how that fits in there. The second would be tracking of the, when an initiative is proposed, because that makes it um, open to the public um, and they are able to find out about the process. And as I said, I didn't till September. So if you look at the state level and county level, a lot of cities I've been, I've lived in, they, as soon as someone puts a, or gives a petition to the city clerk's office, it appears on the website as a petition that's been proposed. Then the next tracking part is when the petition comes back with sufficient signatures. It is then put on the website saying this has been You'll certified as sufficient. <laughs> All right. Am I out of time? Yeah. Oh, you just I, hurry. You just go ahead and wrap up. Okay. So, so I'm looking to see if there can be tracking. And the last thing is, um, the city clerk gives a forum. So on the sixth of June, she had a forum for the candidates, telling about the process and what they had to do. I'm just wondering if they could also include people who want to do initiatives, so that when she does the packet and and is doing the the forum, that she has in mind that people might want to also um, do an initiative because they have to follow about the same procedures, same rules and regulations. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Appreciate it. And also, if you don't mind, there are cards in the back that you can fill out with your name and then a little bit of the information and your contact information, and we'll get back to you. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Jack? Good evening, Council. Uh, Jack Randall, 2600 West Main. Right now you've got maybe, not tonight, but you've got maybe the most important meeting going on for the future of Littleton that there is, and that's the Charter Commission. Uh, they're meeting from three to five on certain days, and there's meeting at the library. That really would seem to me to be worth a video archive and being meet, meeting here so that they're making the discussion. I understand there's 14 people there, but that is a, I've been attending the meetings and they're gonna make changes in the rules that govern the city. Uh, I highly recommend that you might consider putting Doug up there with a camera and putting it on the web because it is very interesting where they're going. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, we'll move to consent agenda. And a consent agenda item can be adopted by a simple motion. All the, um, let me find it here. All ordinance must be read by title prior to a vote on the motion and any consent agenda item may be removed by the request of a council member. Um, item 6A is a resolution approving a budget for, the 2014, for 2014 for the City of Littleton, Colorado Emergency Medical Transport Enterprise. Item 6B is a resolution approving a budget for, the tw for 2014 for the City of Littleton, Colorado for the sewer utility enterprise. And item 6C is a resolution to approve Aspen Grove's Business Improvement District's 2014 operating plan and budget. I need to pull that. Okay, that's been pulled. Um, so Madam Chairman, I move that we approve consent agenda items 6A and 6B. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve items 6A, 6B. <coughs> Bruce. There you go. The vote there is seven go. in favor. The motion carries. Okay. Bruce. Yeah, I'm only, I'm pulled uh, 6C not by virtue of uh, having any concern about the topic, 
there's a letter in here from Aspen Grove Business Improvement District's attorney, which is the firm of Collins, Cockrell, and Cole. And I've got a personal relationship with Jim Collins, who's one of the principals. I would uh, like to recuse myself from voting on this just by virtue of the appearance of having the relationship uh, with that individual in that firm. Okay. All right, so I need a motion. Madam Chairman, I move that the resolution approving, the ASP, approving Aspen Grove's Business Improvement District 2014 <coughs> operating plan and budget be approved. You need a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. The vote is six in favor, the motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Item, mm -hmm. item 7A is an ordinance on second reading approving the 2014 annual appropriation. I'll read the ordinance. This is an ordinance of the city of Littleton, Colorado to be known as the annual appropriations bill for all municipal purposes of the city of Littleton, counties of Arapahoe, Douglas, and Jefferson, state of Colorado, for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2014, and ending December 31, 2014. Okay, let's see. Council, I think the, um, the best way to do this is to go down the list and then discuss each of these as we may have and bring Doug or yeah, and I think, uh, Mayor, Doug? I think, do we have some slides as well, too? Do you have a... I have a couple of uh, handouts I'd like to put up on the okay. projector, projection system. First, I'd like to... Uh, good evening, Council. Doug Farman, Finance Director. Mm -hmm. Just a general overview about the 2014 annual appropriations. The Council budget discussions were held this year on September 9th and 10th, and the total... 2014 uh, proposed annual appropriations is $75.4 million, or 4.5% higher than the 2013 adopted budget. And the largest fund, the general fund, is $3.3 million, or 6.8% above the 2013 budget. In the 2014, there is a $917,000 proposed transfer to the Capital Projects Fund. Um, so excluding the transfer, the 2014 general fund appropriations is increasing by 4.9%. The 2014 proposed general fund revenues are planned to be 7.3% 7, 7 above the 2013 adopted budget for revenues. And the 2014 annual appropriations ordinance does include 12 separate city funds. And the 2014 budget also includes a 17% general fund reserve. So just to elaborate a little bit more on the city's general fund, which is the largest fund. Other way. I do have some handouts in the back for the public if you're unable to view this. Um, these were the changes that council made during their, their two days of budget discussion. Uh, you can see there were various uh, revenue changes. A lot of those have to do with the fire contract we have with the, with the two fire districts, Highlands Ranch Metro District and Littleton Fire Protection District. It's a contract reimbursement of, of expenditures, so some of the changes to expenditures in the fire department did affect the revenues, and you can see the changes up there on the slide. And so in the end, um, the council um, did approve to, to come here tonight with annual appropriations of approximately $52 million for the general fund. And you can see that still maintains the city's proposed reserve amount of 17% for the general fund. I don't know if uh, council has any more questions or clarifications about that information. One more slide on the city's general fund, and this does show a trend of the uh, revenues, expenditures, and also the ending fund balance. Um, the ending fund balance for 2013 is estimated at $8.3 million, and in 2014, it actually grows by $300,000 to $8.6 million, 
And that's because expenditures are projected to grow. And so in order to maintain that 17% reserve that we were talking about for operating expenditures, then the uh, fund balance would grow by approximately $300,000. So this uh, encapsulates all the changes council went through during those two days. And you can see in that transfer out to other funds, the $917,000 is part of that $1.2 million transfer out for capital projects in 2014. Any questions on that information? Doug, uh, I don't know, can I, I was trying to say. Phil. Uh, <laughs> Doug, uh, recognizing that some of it is a uh, increase in the capital projects transfer, um, do you have a, a number that uh, is the reduction in expenditures just kind of net of the capital projects change? I don't have the number like I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, let's see. It equated to about a 1.9 percent uh, change. So the overall expenditure change in general fund was 6.8 percent, but excluding that capital projects fund transfer, it's 4.9 percent. Um, but it, we didn't have any 2013 budgeted amount for capital projects fund transfer, but that full 917,000 is in the 2014 budget. So you can see, budget to budget, it is 917,000 dollar difference there. Chris. And I think it's worth making the comment that with the budget the council worked on last year as well as the one we just are completing and talking about today, we are taking any excess fund balances and we're putting them into that capital projects fund rather than a past practice which was to move them in, into the next year's operations fund. I think what we're doing and have been doing for this these two times is just a, a stronger way for the public to see the budget. If we have something left over, we're not spending it, we're putting it into a place where it either pays a loan or buys a one-time purchase, that kind of thing. We're not just putting it into uh, next year's operational budget. And I think that's uh, a very, very much better practice. Yes, sir. I also just wanted to go through the council communication just in a little bit more detail. We talked about the general fund, but there were some other fund changes. Um, based on those two days of discussion and also a couple items that were not brought up during the proposed budget discussion. Um, we, we talked about the general fund. We also had some changes in the capital projects fund. Um, there were a couple of policy questions council had changed and capital funds uh, fund balance as a result of those changes increased by $662,000. So that, that capital fund projects fund balance is growing as a result of that and as a result of the general fund transfer. In the public facilities fund, um, staff had also proposed an extra $57,630 to, to go ahead and fund the sidewalk program. There are many sidewalks in the city that need repairs and Public Works has assessed the, the condition of those sidewalks and that is a result now that we are proposing and requesting that additional $57,000 for sidewalk repairs for 2014. So can we come in on that now or you want us to hold? Well, I what I'd like to do is go down through, through the communication, so the council communication so that everybody can follow it along too. If that's, okay. is, is that workable? Sure, sure, I can actually, open it up if anybody else have any, has any further questions on the information that was brought forward. Staff can try to answer those, those questions now. So that, that last part is related to policy question 27 or? I believe it's uh, 28. 35 or, excuse me? Uh, policy question 28. 28, gotta scooch it you're, up a You're point. speaking of the sidewalk? Yes. Program, yes. Yeah, there was two policy questions. 27 was dealing with the 50-50 program. Yeah. And, and 28 was the request for funding. Okay. 28's not listed in the communication. Right. So this is an additional one. So if, so I can come in on that one. Um, Go ahead. Now. So I'm really pleased to, um, to see that recommendation. I'm glad we, we've got that money. Um, 
I think having sidewalks in good condition is one of the many factors that helps us cultivate a, a sustainable community, a healthy community for people of all ages, people who push baby carriages and so forth, and the little kids that ride the little bitty tricycles and so forth. Um, and it's also, um, in my mind, important to have good sidewalks literally and figuratively for what I love. You all have heard me talk about the curb appeal of the city. It's what helps us attract and retain the residents and the businesses and get people to invest in the city. So I think that's a really um, super um, additional amount for us to invest. So, thank you. Thank you. And Chris? just to make that clear, the, the, the additional funds that you're putting in there, that's not through the community block grant. That's not going to be coming in that way. This is city, city raised funds. That's correct. That's correct. This is separate funds coming from the public facilities fee. Good. That's so that. A special revenue source. For the, for the public out there, that's, that's a lot more money than we were we would propose because we've used a community block grant That's correct. in the past just to get that done. Block grant is totally separate, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. It's, it's not as much a, a question as to just affirmations to uh, as we've gone through some of this. Uh, one, uh, Doug, is with regard the uh, policy question one and the change of 200,000 uh, as we went through our discussions, uh, that was to cover a potential compensation committee recommendation, uh, and uh, we put that aside until the recommendation would come through. Uh, second, with regard policy question two, it's in the it's in the communication, but um, really staff's uh, objective is to uh, um, or expectation is to try and hold to the 10 hours per week. Uh, on that item. And then with regard uh, policy questions three and four, um, which is a, expanding the city's role in, in marketing in that um, I don't know if you or the city manager wants to uh, address some uh, questions, but possibly adding to that uh, what the city might see a little bit differently or how that position's gonna be up, appraised. Okay, great. Yeah, it's, I think the city manager would like to respond to that. Um, and we, um, Kelly and Artie um, can join us as well for that. Is the question specifically on the outcome component on that? What folks are going to see differently and, and how that position is actually going to relate to other activities across the departments in the city? We'll have Kelly start and then we'll, we'll tag team it for you. Good evening, Council. Um, I want to take you back to 2010 um, where, in my view, this is all where it started. Um, you retain the services of the University of Denver Daniel School of Business. The students under the supervision of Dr. Johnson did both a marketing audit and a branding audit of the city. And as a result, um, what the students found was that we really don't have a brand, we really don't do any marketing, and our website was in dire need of being updated. And so at this point, you funded money in the 2011 budget to update the website, and we all know the result of that. Um, we just finished, back in the spring, um, the branding project, and you all know the result of that. And um, now it's about marketing. Um, what you'll see different next year, I think, is partnerships is a big part of it. Uh, I think this event has sort of, um, there's been some discussion in the community that this was a high-priced party planner. I, I really think nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I think what this position is going to do initially is look at all of the events that go on in the community. We've identified 10 partners in Littleton, and they range from um, Breckenridge Brewery to Aspen Grove to Alamo Draft House, Hudson Gardens, the downtown merchants, 
Uh, I'm not going to name them all because surely I'll forget somebody. But we've identified 10 partners that we want to work with. And we want to look at all of the events that go on, not just in Littleton, but also in the South Metro area. And we're going to look at the events that we do now and see if there are partnerships that we can form to do these events better and to make them stronger. The ultimate goal is to bring new people into downtown Littleton. And one of the things that are into the city of Littleton, one of the things we've heard over and over from the Criterion Bike Race, um, many of those participants in the race and their family members, as well as the merchants, have said, people talked about, I've never been to downtown Littleton. Wow, this is really something else. Please, please do this race again. We love being down here. So um, I hope that answers your question in a roundabout historical way. Okay, and then um, how does it relate to uh, what might be some of the expectations with other departments and contrasting it and what's happening relative to, say, community development or economic? It I'll jump in on that one. I think that they're relatively, it's in the same service of economic vitality, but they are taking it from different facets of it. So community development, if you think about it through the land use, is creating the um, opportunity for the built environment of which an event may happen, a business may be built, commercial, retail, whatever it may be. Um, economic development then is going to out there and working to fill those, that built environment, the buildings, office space. And then the marketing and communications role is to tell the world about this great place to come and visit, spend your money, come back to, move to, all of that. So they work in concert with each other, but each taking a different role. And they're certainly in communication with each other, so we all know what we're doing. So the left hand's talking to the left hand because we're all left-handed or right-handed and we're not having those um, disconnects. So I think this this is that as you've asked the question, probably the third leg of that three-legged stool that we just went through. Thanks for the question. Bruce. I, I have a question uh, just to carry on a discussion that I think we had during the uh, budget hearing, and that was, I, I know I asked whether uh, the development of that position and the roles that it had could be closely monitored and worked with council because I thought that the the uh, outcomes that we were looking for were very close to the specific goals of council and that our input in this would be very important. So I just wanted to restate that. And I, and I know uh, the second and third issues that I heard discussed were, um, I believe Phil had talked about looking for some kinds of m metrics or measurements of success and perhaps putting a dollar item to it if possible to say that this position is generating some degree of uh, money and funds and turning over in the community and Phil you could amplify on it if you needed to but and the other comment that I know uh, Debbie and uh, somebody else had was the need for a, a real job description so that we knew what we were getting into and what what it would encounter and I really think those are important because this is as I saw it a way to get less than Littleton's message out there and I was looking at Sprouts going into Englewood and uh, Trader Trader Joe's going just off the border over on Orchard and University, and I'm saying to myself, where was Littleton's story? Who was saying what there is for those folks in Littleton? And this was the answer to it in my mind. So, But I do think that those issues really need to be addressed before the program is um, memorialized in funding. Okay. Any other? Peggy. Yeah, so... Um Piggybacking on what Bruce just said, I, I thought we had said in the budget study session, indeed, that we wanted to see the job description and the met metrics, the goals, whatever, all um, written out before we really would fund this. And I have, to, I have to back up and say I was one of the big suggestors to Michael for this based on a session I attended at the CML annual conference. But I'm, what I hear different council people saying, and maybe Michael too, are not um, all the same things, which to me says we really need to get this more clearly defined. So in a minute, I'm probably going to move to amend the budget with, for various reasons, I mean related. So uh, a couple comments. One, um, to go back to the metrics, 
piece of it is um, marketing is a is a intangible and slow process. Um, and um, Kelly and certainly those of you who have worked in that arena, you can spend more doing the audit and working on the metrics than you can on the actual production of the marketing and outreach itself, depending upon how um, detailed you want to get about that. I think what, to Councilmember Sinanik's earlier question, um, in terms of what you're going to see is what you're going to see is a slow evolution. It takes time to get the word out. You know, the example of there's a reason that Coca-Cola continually advertises because they don't want to lose that market share. And so they don't sit back on their laurels, but it took them years and decades and, of marketing and outreach to get that word out to the point that probably none of us know whether we like Coke, we just know it brings us a smile. So um, what, we're, what we're doing is that slow incremental outreach to get the word out. And it's somebody coming down and having a great time at the block party and they heard about it through some marketing campaign and then coming back and telling their friend and then the next year you have two people or you have four people coming down. It's us working with the downtown or Hudson Gardens or ACC on, on enhancement of the current events that's out there or the creation of a new event. Kelly talked about the criterium and there's already talk about how can we make it bigger and better and um, what were the impacts of this one, the debrief and all of that. And so if next year it's slightly better attended, it was not well attended, we did not play that strong role of marketing in this one. Um, and so we will be tracking that and certainly to Council Member Beckman's question about expenditures, tracking with each, within each of the different um, marketing arenas of web or print or in the event arena, one of the things we've been talking about is tracking so that the council knows the block party costs the city of Littleton X amount or the um, 4th of July costs us X amount. And so we have those, I forget how Doug has it set up, but it's set up so that there's um, project funds so that we can track that in the totality of the city's budget. So we don't have to call the police chief and then call the fire chief, but we can just we can run a financial report and tell you what all those are. So there'll, there'll be expenditure tracking components of it. We'll be working with, um, we've continued to work with Philosophy, um, who Kelly mentioned earlier. We'll continue to work with them. They are um, certainly um, a well, um, reasonable, um, costed um, entity and they have a lot of experience. They can tell us how many hits. They can give us the free piece of it. Um, and Doug, then, turn on the document camera. And she's going to show you part of what we're marketing. Um, and then working it through. And we do have um, job descriptions. We're still working on them um, in the sense that it is, um, it is a reshifting of all the positions within Kelly's department. And so it's not just writing one job description. And I would encourage council not to drill down to the level of approving or disapproving a job description. I might say that it's outside of the purview but it's the policy direction of what we're doing and make sure the clarity is there. I mean, we certainly have it, we can share it with you. It's a, it's a, it's a document, we've got salary ranges within it. Um, but it is gonna be somewhat of an evolution as, as Kelly looks at the skill sets that she has. We look at the skill set of the individual that we bring in. We look at the other people within, that, in, within her department. We look at how philosophy can support us, who the partner is that we're working with us and each Components going to be a unique makeup of what what the relationship needs to be, and so in one we might play the role of convener, and in, in another we might play the role of lead marketer, and the other one we might it might be solely in the event kind of physical support world. And so what we're doing is we're talking about moving into that greater partnership with the private sector around telling that story that we've been talking about in here. And so I just would. I would caution the council on trying to put it in a too fine of a little box because I, I truly believe um, that we can meet all of the broad spectrum of expectations that are out there um, that people have because we need to. In order for us to be successful, we've got to work with the downtown merchants and they're going to have a certain level of expectation. Obviously, you guys are going to be setting the policy direction and we'll have seven different views of what that means out there. You're looking at two additional views right here. And if we're working with Hudson Gardens, that'll be something different if we're working with Tim and the museum, et cetera. So um, 
this is really about that broad marketing communications. It's, it's expanding what we've been doing in a greater and more intentional manner for, to that extent. But we do have job descriptions. They still have draft written all over them, but be happy to uh, meet with you and, and um, discuss those. And just to add on to that, marketing positions in city government are nothing new. Um, they're new to us, but there are many, many cities in Colorado who have a marketing person on staff. So there are a lot of job descriptions that we've looked at, and we've put one together. So we do have a job description. I just want to remind you just of four data points that are um, very fresh in my memory. This time last year, we conducted a citizen survey and a business survey. And just to remind you and and our viewers and people in the audience that don't know, in the citizen survey, 80% of respondents believe that it is essential or very important for Littleton to promote itself as a location for business, shopping, recreation, and entertainment. 97% of respondents indicated they support the city strengthening Littleton's image and identity. 93% of respondents supported marketing downtown Littleton to residents and visitors, and 74% of respondents thought city finance, marketing, and promotion would be very beneficial or somewhat beneficial. Any other questions? I would just add that I think one of the other benefits of this is the competitive nature of events, it's, it's becoming even more and more competitive in the metro area and particularly where you start to see these new kind of micro economies popping up and um, without having someone paying attention to that and the tools and equipment to be able to recruit that type of event to Littleton, they just, they, they go where they're asked to go, or they go where people already have a plan in place that they can have those events. So I think um, that helps to keep us on that, on that same plane instead of having to go across borders to attend the event that really should be happening here. So another benefit. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so if we're going down through policy questions, we're on 10. And Mayor, I would just to close on Council Member Beckman's um, comment about um, working closely with the Council. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Policy question 10, anything there, guys? Policy question 27, 35, 36. Anything on the police department item that was revised? That's an increase of $10,000 to the Humane Society. And that's based on, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, that's based on a um, calculation they have based on an estimate of the number of dogs and cats they, or animals that they expect next year based on current usage? You are correct. Okay. Um, and then the city clerk added a revision um, expecting, anticipate, due to anticipated changes in updating the city code in 2014, some additional help with the or increased cost in the codification. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the fuming services. So what does that put our total annual cost in for that? About $59,000. We can, $59,000 for 2014. Like we can get the exact number here for you. But it's and that's just in the, that's the, the police department piece of it? That is not the, the, not no, the that Humane is the, Society. That, that is the fee from the Humane Society for um, animals that are dropped off um, by citizens, you know, Littleton dropped off by us, um, found uh, dead. So that's their, the total cost then for next year is 59000 mm -hmm. Yes. I thought it was more society. than that this year. The, the original, mm -hmm. well, if you recall, the original contract was for 50000 when we started the partnership with them. And then a few years ago, we saw that significant ratcheting up. And I think uh, Council Member Cernanek this last year, um, I don't remember, but had said the original contract was 50 We were going to give them 50 for it. And so, and, you, and you'll remember, um, Mayor Brinkman and I were going out and we had the 
area meetings, which at the end of the day ultimately resulted in people saying we're really happy with what we do <laughs> ourselves, and so we were left with Englewood and working with the um, Humane Society. And, but during that process, they they shifted from a here's the here's the amount we make in the private sector, and so Inglewood and Littleton, will you, you need to make up the difference, which is where we were starting to see those 90,000, 75,000, I don't remember the exact numbers, and the outcome of this was them moving much more to a per animal basis and shifting and focusing on getting um, private sector dollars through their okay, um, adoptions so and trainings, down. and so, yeah. so our, we're still slightly higher just for, full disclosure than the original contract of the 50. But I think, and the mayor joined me for all those meetings, um, I think we're comfortable that at least it's based upon a per dog average and the number of animals that we have. And their long range projections is, are that the, the per animal number will continue to go down as they shift to the private sector model from relying on the governments. Thank you. You're welcome. And I believe that our per animal cost has come down. I, yes, I believe not, so. Not huge, but in part because of some of the work that they are doing. And, and I think it was, it was a study session that we had with Inglewood, and we discussed that pretty extensively. And they've made, they've made some good strides in supplementing that. So, okay, moving on. The Capital Projects Fund, um, any questions on the revenues there? Expenditures, um, policy question 11, 34. Okay, um, expenditures on the public facilities fund. Any questions on the open space expenditures policy question 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, or 22? Emergency medical transport fee revenues, any questions there? And we did have on um, property and liability insurance fund, we do have an increase there. Um, this was something I think during the budget study sessions, Eric said he would have this number for us, and he does this item. It's a revision to the proposed budget by $50,000 um, and includes a 13% premium increase. Okay. All right. Council, any other questions? Okay, since this is a, thank you, Doug. Since this is a public hearing, I will open the public hearing. And I have no one signed up on the roster, so if there is anybody who didn't sign up but would like to speak, you're welcome to come down. Jack, please give your name, address, and you have four minutes. Twenty six hundred West Main. Jack Randall, twenty six hundred West Main. My comments are on policy question three of creating the communications and events department going through the wading through the budget pages it looks to me like there's two hundred and fifty one thousand dollars that's going in now creating a budget from when they're transfer money from the city manager nine hundred thousand if you took that two hundred and fifty one thousand dollars and put it in something that was real and beneficial directly to the citizens. For example, a no excuses snowplow fund. There was a little moisture came down up north. If that had come down in the winter, we'd had snow, we'd still not be getting around. So you put that money into a no excuses <coughs> snowplow fund each year and you guarantee that we will plow everything out and people will be able to get around and the businesses will not be locked out. If you put it in better road repair, that word would get out. If you put it in anti-gang activities in the police department, that word would get out. Those are actual tangible things that can in fact be measured and people would be talking about it. It would be unique, a no excuses snowplow program. That would be something that could build on, and people would say, you go to Littleton, you can always get around. You go to Littleton, the streets are good. You go to Littleton, there's no gang activities. That is a brand. It's a good place to live. It's a good place to do business. The council takes care of the people that live here. 
they help the businesses that are here, they don't have to go out and get a trumpet and talk about it because everybody else would be talking about it. If you're going to get an event like this and put it on and hope that you can make a story that makes us different from anything, well, we're anything but little now, but you would have a deal. This is the place to live if you use that money every year and put it in a continuing fund, not for the circuses, not to start a bakery to put out the bread, but to put out real services to the people that live and do business here and the property owners now. That would be a beneficial use of this. I think this is not necessary, and the money could be much better used other places. Thank you. Anyone else? Norm? Good evening, Council. Norm Brown, 6081 South Spotswood. And by the way, there aren't any of the cards up in back. So um, if you've got some, I'll take one back up for the nice young lady. Um, I also have a concern about that policy question. A year ago, you guys asked for some measurements regarding the employee health clinic that came forward as a policy issue. I believe a month ago, you said, uh, you asked, well, what, where are we at with that? At least at some meeting I heard, and the uh, city manager responded that, well, the vendor didn't really want to uh, report on anything until after a year had gone by, and so I don't believe you have anything in front of you for that policy question a year ago. Uh, if I'm incorrect, somebody tell me. But that's my understanding from attending these meetings. Um, there's a lot of reasons not to do things. When I supervised people, there were people that always could find some reason they couldn't proceed. Uh, but I think you could have insisted from the vendor that, well, we will take a nine-month report and we will extrapolate and we will know what has happened with that policy issue. If you go into this without anything measurable, you ask for that um, uh, in the budget hearings, and I don't think you've got anything in front of you job description apparently is being drafted, well, I would ask you to set it aside and wait till you've got something in front of you, and then in a year you will be able to measure what has happened. Um, I thought the analogy of New Coke, of Coke was interesting in their advertising. Remember New Coke? Obviously with Coca-Cola, that's a voluntary transaction. It, you buy the product if you want it. If you want New Coke, you buy it. Um, it was very quantifiable, and Coca-Cola found out it wasn't working out. You don't have any way to find out. Um, you have, they tried new Coke. You have a new logo, and quite frankly, it looks like somebody stubbing out a cigarette. I don't think it's going over quite as well as, as uh, it should, but you've got it anyway. You spent $46,000 on that. I urge you to figure out how to measure this job and this expenditure because it's not a voluntary transaction. The citizens, whenever they buy something, and we try to shop in Littleton, are required to pay the uh, sales tax and to pay all of the associated taxes and fees to the city, uh, just you know, for building permits and everything else. It's not voluntary, so please measure it and get our money's worth. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Anybody else? Speak to Joycelyn Street. Your name and address. Joycelyn Street, 791 West Prentice Avenue. And on the same subject, I am concerned about the expenditure um, for the, um, the marketing and, and uh, the, the position of the 250 some thousand dollars. I think it would be best if the private sector um, handles that. I've lived in communities like Hilliard that used to be a, a little city that was annexed into Spokane, Washington. And they, the whole um, business district got together. They created a historic district just like you did. And yours is beautiful. I, when I moved here, I was just in awe of what you had been doing with it. 
And that's the same thing that Hilliard is working toward. They're trying to um, be, become what your district is. But all of the business people got together and they created different committees like the Greater Hilliard Business District, Hilliard Community Futures, a nonprofit. I mean, many of these things that all came together in an effort to promote this district. And they did, they did and are doing a very fine job. And I don't see that equivalent here. And I'm wondering if that couldn't be looked at first before using taxpayer dollars to um, do the same thing that the private, uh, the, the, I think that the private community could be doing to promote themselves. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. And I need a motion. I move the ordinance approving the 2014 annual appropriation be approved on second reading. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Council discussion. So, um, Peggy? Yeah. No, I'll wait. I want to make an amendment, so. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, um, mm -hmm. I would like to delete Q3 and 4 until we have the okay, job. Okay, you're going to have to. Whoops. Until we, I'd like to delete, I move we delete um, policy question funding um, three and four until we have the job description that gives us some sense of exactly what the position's going to do. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to remove policy question four from the budget. Three and four. Three. Three and four? Correct. Okay. Discussion? So, I, again, I attended this session at CML that makes me think this has really, really great um, possibilities because I heard what was going on in two other places that was absolutely incredible and lifted the city um, activities and generated revenue significantly. So I am... I'm really tilting on this, but I would like to see um, more um, on this and what we're really trying, um, how, how we'll know if we're succeeding. So, and Other questions? Bruce? Yeah, I'm going to oppose the amendment. Uh, many, many other communities that we do actively compete with are very aggressive in terms of their marketing. We've been working on doing a better job of telling the Littleton story for the past three years. And uh, interestingly, a fair to a large portion of our sales tax revenue is the result of people shopping in Littleton from outside the community. Uh, the more we promote ourselves, the more we bring external dollars in to support what we're doing. And I think this is a, uh, a good program to continue the momentum that we've established. Jerry. I, I, I think, as you had mentioned, uh, Mayor, the, the competition around the city, it, it, had had, it has increased, and it is getting rather intense at this point. I think uh, special needs uh, or special events is an opportunity, or it can be a missed opportunity, uh, for us to showcase the city of Littleton. Uh, and that can have a favorable and unfavorable uh, effects on the city if we don't get involved right now. I think uh, marketing is not only for today, of course, it's, it's also for the future. And, and while I, I agree with one of the speakers that it, it is up to the, the, the owners to really market their businesses, I do think the city does need to play a role but without interfering, without getting in the way and, and making it more difficult. Uh, the, the city does need to increase revenues now and in the future, as we all know. Um, I think we can sit around and watch or we can be a part of, of the, the positive growth of our revenue. So I, too, will oppose the amendment. Okay. Phil. With uh, this, it, I think folks need to understand, too, that uh, the position that this does take is not a new position. It's a repurposed position. And uh, with this, uh, there's a more than a fair number of empty storefronts in the city and if you go to the uh, Office of Economic Development and International Trade, 
uh, as well as my experience in interviewing CEOs and, and business owners on why they locate to particular locations. Um, one of the things is the ambiance, the environment, uh, a lot of what uh, was on that simple list of what does make Littleton special. Um, but folks come for some enjoyment, some entertainment, some uh, good time. Uh, hence, uh, Aero Electronics is now uh, a Colorado business. Uh, and uh, that's certainly the one that's the, the largest one, not that we're looking to uh, attract a, a company of that size necessarily, uh, but that folks will uh, relocate. And if you talk to some of the Littleton business owners on why they're here, uh, it's because of the community or why they bought a business that's here and have reinvested in those businesses. And uh, I appreciate our, our use of the dollars um, and wanting to be very careful with that. Uh, during the budget discussions, I, I did ask the city manager with this budget, um, are we gonna get what we've had? And he said, not only that, but we will increase our expectations of quality services. So uh, there are elements that I think are built into the budget elsewhere to address some of those uh, items, at least in a general sense of uh, community outreach and um, whether it's uh, specifics in the individual departments, you have to dig into some of the department plans on that, but there is a lot of detail on that. So I too will be in opposition to this. Bruce. I want to mention one thing that might add a little more perspective. The events that we run now in the city now uh, include costs for fire protection, police protection and street involvement, each one of them. And they're individually handled, they're individually worked on. Some of them, in, in my experience, have been minimally done and probably not very well done. I can think of a 5K run or uh, a motorcycle rally that didn't have enough planning going into it, didn't have enough consideration for medical issues. In fact, the motorcycle uh, rally had an accident just right on the edge of the city. Th those are incredibly important safety issues and probably having a, uh, a centralized ability to work out those planning and budgeting issues, I think might actually make the, the event safer and would incorporate what are current, already current costs. If we want to expand that, that's additional costs and to do it in a big way, it's big additional costs. So we're not talking about just a party planner, we're talking about somebody that's gonna have the ability to influence a lot of city expenditure. And the, the other thing I want to mention is, you know, again, it's, it's about the future of Littleton is about getting people who want to come and live here and do business here and bring their businesses here. It's what it's going to take for us to compete with the Centennial. Now at Lone Tree is a tremendous competitor of ours. South Jefferson County, each one of these folks has someone in this type of of job. Sometimes it's in economic development or planning, but believe me, they're doing it. And it's, I think it's important for Littleton to step up to this. If we had just gotten Sprouts, or if we had just gotten Trader Joe's, if we had just gotten one more retail business into Broadridge, it would make the difference to pay for this. And I think that's, that's my expectation of the position. I do want to say, though, I'm, I'm Reflecting Peggy's point of view, I want to be on top of this one because this is the future of Littleton and uh, it, re it really needs to make sure that the council is involved because there's a lot of community doubt whether this will work. There's and if we don't have community acceptance of this, it's, it's, it's doomed from the start. So I reluctantly support moving ahead, but I got to tell you that I'm right, right at the point where if it's not supported in the community or it doesn't seem like it's working very well, it really needs to be relooked. Thank you. Um, six years ago, <clears throat> and I've been on council for six years, there's been a constant mantra in the community, and that is, why don't we tell our story? Why are we keep ourselves the best kept secret? Why don't we share the news? We do these surveys, and it comes back I mean, pretty impressively in the 80s and 90 percentile from the respondents that this is important to the community and important to the citizens. I've heard positive response from the community, Bruce, um, regarding this and people that are glad that we're actually considering doing something like this because they're watching what other communities are doing and they're seeing that we're not doing it and they're seeing as lost opportunities. 
Um, I think that we have a, you know, we've got a, as Phil mentioned, this is not, we're not funding this fully out of new money. There was some consolidation in some other staffing positions, which has allowed us to be able to actually put this, put this position together. And I think that Kelly's department does what they can do with the time that they have, the resources that they have, the demands are getting higher and higher and higher. And if we want to continue to just, you know, to do the best that we can with what we have, then we're going to continue to do exactly what we're doing. And I'm hearing that that is not good enough anymore. It's not the staff is saying that, council is saying that, and the community, um, for the most part, is also saying that. I. In terms of being able to balance whether or not, or judge whether or not this position is working, just an off story, I recently was over at the New Balance store in Aspen Grove, and I asked them how they were doing, and he said, this is, we have the best opening that a store has ever had right here in Aspen Grove in Littleton. I said, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. That's great news. We need to tell that story. And he goes, well, he goes, you guys were great. You came in here. You did a story on us. You put it in the Littleton report. And he said, we had such a surge in business from that report, from that story, and was just thrilled with that. So, it, you know, there's, there's um, information that we don't have unless we go in there to buy a pair of shoes and talk to the guy. But, but that's the type of stuff that happens, and it happens all the time, and it'll happen all over. So um, trying to keep track of that is going to be difficult, but watching these guys' sales tax um, revenues, our sales tax revenues go up and their sales go up, I think is the, the biggest barometer. Um, so I, I'm going to oppose the amendment. Any other discussion? Okay. Council ready to vote? This amendment would delete policy questions three and four from the um, budget approval. If if you do a yes, correct. a yes would delete it. It's important that you tell yes, me. a yes, a yes will vote policy questions three and four off the budget. You would call <laughs> the vote is one in favor. Councilmember Cole voted in favor, and the remainder voted no. The motion fails. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, any other discussion on the budget? Peggy, did you have anything else? Mm -mm. Okay, anybody else? I do. Jerry? I, I, my expectation is that the city manager is gonna monitor this position, the effectiveness of it, and, and that, he, that he'll do what he can to make it uh, work. I, uh, my expectation is also you know that when it's time to pull the plug, uh, this isn't something that we're gonna know in a couple months, maybe not even a year. <laughs> Um, I, I haven't heard a lot of opposition to this. I've heard a, a, a few folks only. I, but marketing is not what it used to be. Marketing is very dynamic. It changes all the time. And I think it is important that Kelly and, and the city uh, keep on top of these kind of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this position. Okay. That we just got through talking about. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. That, I had to add that. <laughs> Two at bites at the apple. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, Any other comments? Council, you're ready to vote on the main motion? Yep. Okay, the main motion approves the 2014 budget. A yes approves that. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries. Mayor, before you move to the next agenda item, I just want to say thanks to the council. You guys put in a lot of hours reading our uh, two-inch binder, and uh, we appreciate the two days of um, uh, discussion on the policy questions. So thank you very much, and we're ready to get to work for 2014. Thanks. Staff did a good job putting yeah, it together. Yeah, really appreciate Doug and Tiffany and the, the whole finance group that always does a killer job on the whole thing. So you guys came through again. Yeah, and again, a, the format that we're using is I like very, very yeah. easy, to, easy to use, easy to work through, and um, being duplicated by other communities. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right, on to 7B. This is also a public hearing. Um, this is an ordinance on second reading, amending provisions of the city code regarding the annual sanitary sewer service charges. I'll read the ordinance. This is an ordinance of the city of Littleton, Colorado, amending provisions of the city code regarding annual sanitary sewer service charges. Council, do you have any questions for staff? Staff, do you have a presentation? 
Do we need one? Just, some, just something brief. Uh, council did approve a resolution earlier this evening to adopt the enterprise fund for the sewer utility fund. And so that um, is the 2014 budget for the sewer fund. And this item tonight is the sanitary sewer charges, which uh, are the user fees that go ahead and fund the programs at the treatment plant that's owned by the cities of Inglewood and Littleton. Um, and then in effect fund the programs that were adopted by council tonight for that resolution. And Mayor, if I could um, add on um, part of, um, I think this was part of the discussion um, during the uh, study session was um, the intent of the fee increases that are being proposed is so that we can cash the capital improvements uh, related to both the interim, um, the uh, short-term projects that were the whole issue around not supporting UV as a component and the consultant had ponied up, I think, about a million dollars in things that would get us through until Reg 85 kicks in. And then in that kind of 17 to 2021 era when we're doing that, um, it is our intent and the calculations are based upon us cash flowing that so we don't have to incur any debt on the Littleton side of those capital improvements. Any questions, Bruce? Yeah, and I think you, you, Michael, you touched on it. The the as as the the gorilla in the room is the by city operating expenditure line, which is is what's it, it goes up fairly substantially year over year. And and you'd indicated that that's you you believe or you guys monitor that. You push back, and I know you and Charlie go to the meetings and and there's scrutiny on those numbers. But some of that has to do with with the optimization of existing systems by virtue of the fact that we turned down, we pushed back on the UV system, which was unnecessary a couple of years ago Correct. to there's meet current certificated compliance standards. Yep. So there's about a million dollars in 2014, of which, of course, we're 50% of that. Which is um, basically the year-over-year -year delta. Correct. Yep. So, and yes, to answer your earlier yeah. question, uh, Charlie in particular is um, a headache for them on many of the operational pieces, Good. so yes. <laughs> Bruce, one thing to add, we did go back to 2008 and look at those operating expenditures from the treatment plant, and they have been flat between 2008 and 2012. So this year's budget is really conservative, and you'll see in 2013, we expect to end um, short of the budgeted amount for 2013. So we think the 2014 is, is also conservative, but it, you, you should see us underspend that budget line item. Okay, fair, fair enough. And, and the, 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 the increases, though, year over year, I mean, if the basic operating expenditures are flat, then is most of the difference that's on that line item, is that just project-related CapEx kind of stuff? That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Phil? Yes. Uh, Doug, that uh, those capital expenditures aren't in that projection chart that was in the budget, right? The, the major capital items, um, right, they're outside of the five-year review. Um, we expect to start spending them probably in 20, 2018. Um, but again, the, the treatment plan is undergoing that master plan, and they hope to have that out by the end of the year, and we'll have a better idea of when that project would start and the design but the, but process. But they're out there. They're, it's not they're it's out a there. question of uh, which year, not, not if. Um, and then the second item is uh, within the revenue side of it, uh, at least at this point in time, um, uh, if additional residences are built in the city, um, I'm taking it that that's not yet in that conservative projection. There is uh, one project that's already been permitted. We did build that into the projection, but other than that, you're absolutely correct. We don't have any other sewer tap fees projected into the, into the five years. So it would be very conservative growth, except for that one project that um, we, we are fairly certain will happen. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Phil, and you were, your question was regard to the nutrient reg upgrades that, that we're fighting. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Doug. Okay. This is a public hearing, and I have no one signed up on the roster to speak. If there's anybody who would like to speak, you're welcome to come down. Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing, and I need a motion. Madam Chairman, I move that the ordinance amending provisions of the city code regarding the annual sanitary sewer service charges be approved on second reading. Second. second. Peggy. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
No discussion. Ready to vote. The vote is unanimous. The motion carries. Okay, 7C. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an ordinance on second reading approving the 2013 tax mill levy. I'll read the other ordinance. This is an ordinance of the city of Littleton, Colorado, establishing the tax levy of 6.662 mills to defray the costs of municipal government and pay debt service of the city of Littleton counties of Arapahoe, Douglas, and Jefferson, state of Colorado, for the fis city's fiscal year beginning January 1, 2014, and ending December 31, 2014. Council, any questions for staff? Staff, do you have a presentation? Okay. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Um, I have no one signed up to speak on the rosters. Anybody wish to come down and speak? Okay. We'll close the public hearing. Need a motion. Madam Chairman, I move that the proposed ordinance approving the 2013 tax mill levy ordinance uh, holding the mill levy at 662 be approved on second reading. Second. second. Okay, we have a sec motion and a second. Any discussion? Ready to vote? Uh, the vote is six in favor with Councilmember Valdez voting no. The motion carries. Okay. All right, item 10A. These are ordinances on first reading. Oh, D. I skipped D. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is an ordinance uh, amending Title VI, Chapter 4 of the City Code. And actually, this was a public hearing. We held this as a public hearing on October 1st, so we will not um, hold an additional public hearing this evening. I'll read the ordinance. This is an ordinance of the City of Littleton, Colorado, amending Title VI, Chapter 4 of the City Code pertaining to drug paraphernalia and the possession and consumption of marijuana. And I think we'll ask the city attorney. This was something that we needed some clarification on. Do you want to? Um, Mayor, uh, as you recall, there was some question about uh, the issue of the two ounces of marijuana referenced in the ordinance uh, on second reading after the public hearing was closed. <coughs> uh, council continued it. Uh, Deputy city attorney provided you with a memo after we discussed it internally. It, um, we are convinced that the language in the ordinance as you had it and have it tonight is correct. Uh, so she tried to explain that in some detail in uh, the memo that you received and then again it is reiterated at least in part in the council communication in the packet. So uh, we're prepared to answer your questions if you have any um, and we hope that the uh, memo and this information answered the question from the last meeting. Okay. Any questions council? Right. Okay. Bruce? Point of order on your comments about the public hearing. Mm -hmm. What, what, I mean, we, un, we have had public hearings on both first and second readings on occasion. Is there any reason? No, we had this as a second reading and public we hearing it. last week. And, and we, we tabled it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was So a, we held the public hearing. We went through the whole thing. We just yeah. ended yeah. up with that question. Thank you. I appreciate that. We could still open a public hearing, though. Uh, no. We didn't advertise it as a public hearing. It's a second reading, but it's not. As I recall from the last meeting, council decided at the time because the public hearing was closed and this question was uh, right. initially came up during the council discussion of the motion, but the council said we, we will not reopen the public hearing. We'd like staff to get us an answer to this question. We'll continue our discussion and then the ultimate vote on the ordinance until this meeting tonight. Okay. Any discussion on the ordinance? Okay, seeing none, um, well, first I need, I guess, a motion. But it's the continue. I need a motion. You have to reopen, though, right? We tabled the motion. We already have the motion. Okay. 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 So then the motion is to approve the ordinance um, amendment to Title VI, Chapter 4 of the City Code pertaining to drug paraphernalia and the possession and consumption of marijuana. And we did have a second on that. Council, are you ready to vote? Mm -hmm. Devin, we had a second last time. I'm sorry, point of order. Since it was continued, do we need to, we table to move, move to 
bring it into this meeting? Yeah, can because because it was tabled. Uh, I think the proper procedure would be for someone to make a new motion, get a new second, and then vote on that. Okay, okay. that's what we tried to do. Okay, who okay. would like to make a motion? <laughs> Madam Chairman, as I did the first time, I move the ordinance approving the amendment to Title VI, Chapter Four of the City Code pertaining to drug paraphernalia and the possession and consumption of marijuana, be approved. Well, I think you lift it from the table, don't you? I need a second. I'll second whatever we're doing, but I, I think the city attorney advised us to make a motion and get a second, and that's what we have just done. City attorney, is it necessary to lift something from the table? I don't believe it would be inappropriate to do that, but I don't think it's necessary. If we have a new motion and a new second, I think we're fine to proceed. Okay, let's proceed. Council, any discussion? Well, I, I'm sorry. Again, just point of order. If it's a new motion, then do we need to go through the process again, uh, the public hearing process? If it's a new motion, or if we if we lift it from the table, then it's the old motion, isn't it? Right. But you know, give me a second, and I'll look up your council rules. But I, I don't think it's same. necessary to well, but it's how we have a motion to lift question. it from the table. Avengers, so I didn't. I just, I don't think it's the right time to be doing, increasing it. We didn't increase it. Oh, well. Council rules do not um, specifically say that you must make a motion to take something off the table. There is a provision in the council rules that you may make a motion to table or to postpone to a date certain, which is what you did. And the date certain would be, uh, is to be set when that uh, motion is made, which you did. Uh, and there is nothing in the council rules that says the proper procedure is a motion to lift it off the table versus a motion to um, simply approve a new motion and a second. So I guess I'm going to stick with what I said. Mm -hmm. Initially, it would not be inappropriate to act in one way, but it is certainly appropriate. And I feel very comfortable if you just proceed with making the motion in the second. Okay, so we do have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah. Jerry. I, I just feel like the process, if it has to do with marijuana, it seems like our process has been so messed up. I mean, we, I mean, as Mr. Stallman was pointing out a couple things, it, it seemed that we are, we're questioning our process. The, and then the last time we had an issue with marijuana, again, our process was questionable. Um, I, I, that's my only comment on that. It just seems like we've been treating this one kind of goofy for some reason. Okay. Um, any other comments? I guess I would say that I, w I don't agree. I think that we're following our protocol. Um, we pulled this and tabled it because we had some questions about some of the verbiage. It's come back. It's made, made clear. So um, we followed that process, and it's back in front of us to approve. Anybody else have any comments or discussion? Are you ready to vote? This is uh, approving the amendment to Title VI, Chapter 4 of the City Code. Vote is six in favor with Councilmember Valtese voting no. The motion carries. Okay, item 10A. This is an ordinance on first reading adopting the 2012 International Model Building Code. I'll read the ordinance. This is an ordinance for the city of Littleton, Colorado, adopting the International Code of Council's 2012 International Building Code, the International Code Council's 2012 International Residential Code, the International Code Council's 2012 Mechanical Code, the International Code Council's 2012 Plumbing Code, the International Code Council's Fuel Gas Code, the International Code Council's 2012 International Property Maintenance Code, the International Code Council's 2012 International Energy Conservation Code, the International Conference of Building Officials 1997 Uniform Code for the Abatement of Dangerous Buildings, American National Standard U Institute, American Society of Mechanical Engineers A.17.1, 2007, American Society of Mechanical Engineers A.17.2, 
17.3, 2005. American Society of Mechanical Engineers, A18.1, 2005 Safety Code for Elevators and Escalators with Amendments and All Appendices thereto, providing penalties for violations thereto, adopting amendments, and providing notice that copies thereof are available for inspection at the Office of the Codes and Inspection Division. And that's about it. <laughs> okay, so this is a first reading. Council, do you have any questions for staff on this? I do. Okay, Jim, you want to come on down? Um, I'd like to make a number <coughs> of, uh, ask a number of questions tonight so as not to prolong the hearing on election night two weeks from tonight. If that's all right. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Thielen, uh, in the ordinance itself, on page 13, it talked about in line 32, substantial paper. Tell me what substantial paper is. Councilman Taylor, what, what that means is that we don't want to see um, construction drawings drawn on the back of a napkin. Does it have to be to scale? I beg your pardon? Have to be to scale? A, a scale drawing? Typically, you know, that we, we will get drawings for small projects that homeowners might do, building a shed, something like that, that um, certainly isn't drawn to scale. But on your larger projects, that would be required. Thank you. Um, on page 21, at line number 27, uh, it says specified for temporary lighting, heating, or power. I'm assuming that's supposed to be heating. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Page 35 on line 5. Which takes me a while to get there. Um, it, on line 5, it says... Um, Replacement of shingles of the same type and color. And if you've got a 30-year roof on there and you get a hailstorm and you just have to replace part of it because of the direction in which the hail came, mm -hmm. it may not be possible 30 years later to match the color. So is it, is it possible to put in there um, as close as possible to color so that it is... It, it's black, but it's different shades of black sometimes. That we certainly can do that. <clears throat> um, the only thing that um, we discussed this during our study session a little bit. Um, the only thing that that concerns me is um, what is as close as possible to you might not mean the same thing to me. And I think that the reason that we put this in the code was try and get conformity when the insurance company will only replace one, one side of a roof, trying to get those roofs to look, you know, making sure that they're, um, you know, um, of the same type of shingle and, and the same color. Um, and, and, that, that, that was the only reason I didn't put it in the ordinance. And as my close concern as is it may not be possible to even get That's that. That's absolutely color. correct. So I was just trying to give us a wiggle room in there for your yeah. inspector to look at, uh, saying it, it is so similar that nobody can tell uh, without close inspection the differences. That's, right. that's what I was looking at. I can certainly add that. You can, you can deal with that. Okay. Uh, uh, on that same uh, page 35 in line, 30, <coughs> in line 35, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear that, Jim. Page 35, line 35. You're on the same page we were before. Okay. It talks about at least one programmable <coughs> thermostat to be installed. This is on a residential remodeling. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a, 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 a single 10 by 12 bedroom, do you have to have a thermostat inside that room? Not necessarily. So there is some possibility yeah. of, of this being at the discretion of the code inspection. Yeah, I, I think what we're trying to say is that if you're going to, if you're redoing your heating system 
or or putting an addition on or something like that where you would want to put in thermostats that the ones that you do put in are programmable. Okay, and then on, on down a little bit later on line 30, uh, 42, uh, when you're doing remodel, landscaping shall be include uh, zero scaping or hardscaping if it's included in the remodel. Um, if you had to tear out your grass in order to get access to what you were doing, that means you can't replace the grass back in there with this, what well, this says? I, you know, what our, you know, what the intent would be is water conservation. I understand. Um, and that if, and I think the way it's stated is that if landscaping was included in your plan, that you should have some hardscaping, meaning decks or um, um, sidewalks or something like that, patios, that's hardscaping. And zero scaping, just having something that has less, using less water for it to, to continue to grow. But, but I think the caveat to that whole thing is if landscaping is included in your plan. It's not a mandatory thing, only if you are going to include it. Okay, so there is a there is a way out of that. Yes. Okay. On the next page, 36, in the table, 1107.1, under energy conservation, there's no line numbers there, but it's close to the bottom of that page. Um, it talks about... Um, Structured insulated panels. I'm sorry, it's under building. Structured insulated panels. I, I don't know what a structural insulated panel would consist of. Those are fact, factory built walls and roof panels that are insulated with six inches of foam plastic or styrofoam, and it already has the uh, you know, the electrical systems in it, they are very energy efficient, um, being factory built rather than site built. And so you just drop them into place. That's right. Makes construction a little easier. Uh, on the next page on 37, this is under, this is under energy conservation. Um, it talks about 50% of light fixtures it had to be non-incandescent bulbs. Um, how did we pick 50%? It was a number I picked. Okay. Um, that, you know, what we're trying to do is promote energy efficient lighting, doing either compact fluorescence or LEDs or fluorescent lighting, and cutting down on incandescent bulbs, which I think um, the federal government had something to say about that. I might be wrong on that or that. Um, they're produced on a limited basis or not at all. And just below that, motion sensors on exterior lighting. Um, I have a real problem with that in that if you are looking at motion sensors along as Alta Aspen Grove is an example. When those condos were built or apartments were built, um, and the animals in the park, or somebody walking their dog at night and turning on all a, a series of motion sensor lights, to me would not be a good thing. And we probably are going to have more um, development along the Platte River, mm -hmm. and it bothers me if we're requiring motion sensors on exterior lighting. That's not a requirement, it's an option. It's in the table as... Yeah, but it's one of the things they can do for inner... Uh, they pick 10 of those things. Mm -hmm. So I would think the builder would be looking at the context Could of be. the development, but maybe not. That That's a possibility. Because the motion sensors for uh, basements or other areas, uh, there again, why couldn't it be uh, required as a light switch so that if they need it, they can turn it on. If they don't need it, they don't have to turn it on. I think the only reason that we're doing <clears throat> um, the motion sensors 
in the basement is because those are normally not occupied and it could be where that you forget to turn out the lights and this way the lights will go off automatically as far as the motion sensors um, for outdoor lighting i chose that one because in my mind i was only thinking of the backyard um, i wasn't thinking of and maybe i should be more specific where that motion sensor should go or we can even replace that with something else if council feels that's necessary. But perhaps Peggy is correct. It would depend upon the, the place in which you would uh, be doing the building. Right. Let's go to page 39 on line 22. Um, it addresses water soil and waste pipes what's going to be the difference between a soil and a waste pipe a waste pipe usually carries solid waste a soil pipe might carry um, waste from a kitchen or from a laundry room or something like that but realistically both both items are used interchangeably it ends up in the same yeah, place it could be part of the venting system or something like that okay on line 26 of that page it talked about um, uh, exterior water piping being 60 inches below grade. That's quite a bit below fr frost line in, in this area. It, it's typical in the metro area to put it that deep, just in case we do get frost lines. And that's your water service pipe that comes from the street to the house. Okay. And that's a typical depth. It just seems like that it, when people, a lot of people are looking at patio homes without a basement. And you, if you've got a water line coming in five feet below grade, because they also want it to be an accessible dwelling mm -hmm. so that they can get in uh, without having to well, have Well, they would steps. come in, you know, the, the footers are going to go down at least three feet right. on a patio home, something like that. So you'd come in underneath the footers and then come up in the slab or the crawl space or or basement, depending upon the patio home or the home that you have. Just didn't know they would ever put a water pipe underneath a, a footing. Um, page 40. On line 33, these are having to do with fees. Um, an administrative fee of 40% is charged and to me that seemed to be excessive but that's only because somebody's not doing what they should do themselves is that right when you're stepping in because they haven't done it but all of our fees generally are based upon the cost it, co it mm -hmm. that it takes for us to do the job we're referencing, if I remember right, section 7-4-6 in the city code, which deals with the removal of um, rubbish or the cutting of weeds. And the way that section of the code reads is that um, besides the cost of um, cutting the weeds, if the city has to perform that, there's an administrative fee of 25% and then it adds on an incidental fee of 15%. That's how we came up with the 40. And if I remember right, it's in seven, section 7, section 74-6. Okay. Because that same But thing I can ver that, verify that for you. That's correct. That has to, the same has to do with snow removal is another 40% fee. Right. And, and, and I think we're trying to do when the city has to abate any issue, whether it be snow removal or or cutting weeds or anything else that were consistent with the fees that we charge. Okay. Um, page 48, uh, line 10. Um, this is... Uh, This has to do with um, 
the payment of cost of such inspections having to do, I, I guess I was thinking that we may need to add as determined by resolution of the city council because all of our other inspection, inspection fees are done by resolution. This section deals with, it's from the Colorado Health Department <coughs> and it is when you built a, a fireplace or have an insert put in that it meets the environmental protection agencies or the air quality control rating of um, non-pollutant fireplace. Um, the inspections are, are kind of done on site for four. That's not my question. My question okay. is uh, how, uh, how is the, the fees determined? Because in all other places, the fees are determined by resolution of the city council. That's correct. But that's not what it says in here. And I just wanted to have that added at the end of that sentence that it will be as determined by resolution of the city council. So that the city council is determining what those fees are going to be. Okay, I can add that. Councilmember Teller, can I ask you just a question of clarification when we bring this back on second reading? The sentence actually says the owner's responsible for the payment of all costs of the inspection. If I'm looking at the language you're referring to on page 10, the costs are what the costs are. I, 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 are you suggesting a process where every time there's an inspection, staff is going to need to come to council, <coughs> explain what work was done, what the hourly rate was, and get council approval to impose those costs? No, no I'm not. What I'm, what I'm saying is that most of our fees and charges that we make are based upon something that determines by at staff level what it costs the staff to do that job. And when you talk about going back for doing a reinspection, that 40% seems excessively high. Because are, are it's we talking already about been inspected once. Now, or, or are we talking about, I, I thought we were on a different section. I'm sorry. That, Jim, I think that sentence can be taken out because our inspection fees are covered in the building permit fees that are paid and that there shouldn't be any additional cost unless it was an expert in the field that we had to hire to do something like that. Can you clarify? But I think that it's more appropriate just to take that last sentence out. You, you, can you restate where you're at just so we make sure? Can you restate where you're at so we all make sure we're speaking? I'm on page. Question. I was on page 40. 48 of the ordinance. That's line first. 10, or actually beginning on, no. No, it's page 40, line 33, and page 44, line 21. I thought we were talking about page 48. No. The question that Ken raised oh. has to do with question that, the 40%. Ira, you, you had moved us ahead uh, to page 48, line 10, <laughs> and I was asking about that particular section, and then you referred back to the earlier. Oh, I misunderstood um, you. So, I, yeah, I apologize if I was not clear on that. And I think Jim's comment that the last sentence could come out is the last sentence in, on page 48. Line 10. Uh, line 10. Okay. Turning on line. All right. Line nine. We'll take care of that. We can, we can certainly also provide additional information at second reading as to how the 40% is an accurate reflection of the cost and consistent with the other uh, costs for other kind, similar kinds of inspections as Jim referred to. We'll take that back and we'll be prepared to explain that in more detail at second reading. Okay, thank you. And I think for, uh, if I may, Mayor, add in the, that line 10 is a statement to the owner, not a reference to fees, obviously. It's just saying they're gonna have to pay those costs, the fees are still set, and those costs, aka fees, are set by the city council. So it's more of an informative statement than it is a issue around the who's setting the fees. So if, if you would like us to take it out, it's certainly not a requirement, but I think it might give staff something to point to to say you have to pay the fees. That's just a different interpretation than what I came up with when I was reading that. Okay. But I can understand where that came from. 
So I don't care it can stay in there from, under that interpretation. I don't have anything else. Okay. Anybody else? So Bruce, I've, I've already given Mr. Mm. Thielen minor corrections, non-substantive corrections. Okay. Bruce. Hi, Jim. Uh, you, you talk about the in staff analysis on the council communication on the first bullet. You talk about the Energy Conservation Code had undergone multiple changes, and there's some information in there that discusses that with the 2009 and the 2012 code. And then generally in, in, the, in here we talk about the uh, International Building Code. Well, I want to direct your attention down to bullet number, one, two, three, bullet number five, which is that staff is recommending amending the energy conservation requirements in the residential code. Two sections will be added, mandatory requirements for residential remodeling and mandatory requirements for new residential units. And those take us to the page 34 and uh, 35 that Council Member Taylor was talking about. And there is where a choice would be made by the remodeler and owner to take 10 of um, what's suggested there. Where did that come from? Those provisions that we're using um, have come from the International Green Building Code. Um, a lot of the items that we chose were from that code. Um, some of them are from um, the HERS rating system, which is an above code home energy rating system. We took some provisions from there. Um, we met with uh, um, some consultants that deal with energy, energy conservation, and they recommended some things that, that our council might be interested in including in there. So that's where everything came from. <clears throat> I, I guess the concern that I want to express and when we get to the second reading, perhaps it can be discussed further, is uh, I feel like uh, I don't have a problem with international building codes, fire codes. I don't have a problem with what mechanical engineers and, you know, the building, building codes, uh, code contractors come up as best practices. But I am concerned if we're codifying what are really consumer choices and suggestions and turning them into requirements. And uh, I am concerned that in this energy conservation requirements, we take government too far. So I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this council deciding how um, it's social engineering, I think, from a council point of view. It's not mechanical engineering <laughs> from an international point of view. I'm uncomfortable with it. Jerry. Bruce, you stole my thunder. Thank you. That I, I, it, it does seem like we're getting a little nitpicky here, telling people they have to have a timer on their light or motion detector in their basement. I mean, that, that should be their prerogative if they want to leave a light on or not. Uh, if a person has solar, if they want to leave their lights on, that's their prerogative. I, I think we are overreaching here on some of this stuff. And, I, and, and as Mr. Taylor has done, I'm going to go back and read this thing closely for the final reading. And um, I'm not comfortable with a lot of it. It's just, uh, again, I can understand doing the, the international codes, but when we start telling people what kind of light switches they got to put in, um, that's, that's, I find that ridiculous. Bruce. Uh, Jim, on uh, page 12, the whole section 8 there, excavating, excavation and grading, I guess my question on this is it seems awful extensive and we don't have anything in our codes that that deals with this issue it seems like there's a it's a fairly significant attribute of a construction project but up until this point we've never stipulated any criteria with respect to this issue um all of those grading and excavation requirements um, were put into the code at the request of our engineering division. Those requirements come out of a previous code that city city adopted, the 1997 International um, Conference of Building Officials um, Building Code. 
and our engineering division has used those provisions. And when I was preparing the ordinance, I met with them, and I was asked by um, Mr. Bob Deeds that I put those in the ordinance just to have them because we no longer adopt um, the 1997 building code. Does that make sense? Well, maybe. They were in 97, and mm -hmm. now we're adopting a later version, and they are out of the later version? The... Um, the uniform building code is no longer published. Okay. Um, the only codes, the only building codes that are published um, nationwide are the international codes. Mm -hmm. What I did is that I took out verbatim the requirements for grading out of the 1997 code and placed them into the amendment package um, for the international codes. And I put it in into the administrative provisions because they will apply both equally to building code requirements and residential code requirements. Well, I, I don't have heartburn over them. I'm, I guess I'm just surprised that they're not part of the current code environment that's being promulgated by whatever the various organizations are. It, it sounds like it's not, but okay. So, fine. I mean, I'm <laughs> I think it's important to have it in there. I'm just surprised right. we had to go wholesale on, on something of that magnitude. Uh, the other question I was going to ask you was on page 36. Now, was, you know, I, what my colleagues have, have brought up is, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll deal with further on second reading, but I, I wanted to just ask, I guess, something of a technical question where it says mandatory on the under buildings uh, I don't know the third or fourth one down it says vented crawl spaces are not permitted which strikes me as being curious just wouldn't if you've got a crawl space wouldn't you normally want some sort of airflow in there to make sure things don't gases and or whatever stuff that's in there doesn't, you know, has some sort of ability to cycle the air? Right. <clears throat> what you're worried about in crawl spaces are moisture. And um, having it vented does give the air movement through there. What the Energy Conservation Code, or actually what the Green Building Code was looking at, rather than ventilating that and bringing cold air into the crawl space, mm -hmm. um, was to seal those areas up insulate it very well, and um, introduce some heat in that crawl space in order to keep the dew temperature or the dew point low enough where that you don't have condensation or high enough. I'm not sure which one it is. Probably high enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, that's the theory. As opposed to... Yeah. Well. And, and, and you know, I'm a full, I'm, I'm a big supporter of not venting crawl spaces. Really? Okay. I think it gives a much comfortable home. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that create mold? I mean, mo moisture is going to get in there, and if you're heating it up, you're going to get mold. You know, you've got to have a dew point high enough where that you can't form condensation. You know, in a crawl space, not only are you going to insulate the floor joist cavities, you're also going to put a vapor barrier on the ground or maybe even pour an inch and a half of concrete on the ground. Um, I've seen builders do that, but you've got a vapor barrier on there so that you're not going to get moisture from the ground that will come up in the crawl space. Thank you. Any other questions? Bill? N not as much a question uh, as much as uh, asking Jim to clarify. My understanding is uh, that the Board of Appeals did meet and actually reviewed yes, uh, the code. And um, what will be the, this is the question now, uh, what will be the effort to make sure that uh, some of the folks that are in the, the building and the contracting community are aware of the changes and possible, possibly be available for, for comment, either via appearance or communication? We, we have invited um, the Home Builders Association to study sessions and to comment. Um, 
we did that when we had a lot of residential building in the area. We don't have that now. We don't have production builders that we can contact and say, would you like to be present during all of this? Um, and with the commercial buildings that are planned for Littleton, whether it be multifamily buildings or Breckenridge Brewery or some of the other things that are going on, those for the most part are national builders or very large builders in the metro area that um, um, not knowing who the builders are <coughs> for these projects, um, I don't know how I could invite them. But, they, but the uh, projects themselves have been made aware? Yes. Okay, any other questions? Thank, okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, ready to make a motion? I move the ordinance, that ordinance number 34, adopting the 2012 International Model Building Codes be approved on first reading and set for public hearing on November 5th, 2013 at 7 p.m. in the council chamber. Second. Second. Okay, we have a second, Phil. Jim. Any discussion, are you ready to vote? Okay, let's vote. The vote is six in favor with council member Valdez voting no. The motion carries. Yes, please vote. Okay, um, item 10B. This is an ordinance on first reading establishing uh, building code requirements for the cultivation of marijuana. An ordinance of the City of Littleton, Colorado, amending Title IV, Chapter 1, Section 5 of the City Code regarding residential marijuana cultivation requirements. Jim? Council questions for Mr. Thielen. Bruce. I get Good evening, Council. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Jim, a uh, question for you on um, page two, line 16, about electrical. Given what you've got in here, I guess, it, would it not be prudent on these sorts of installations to require a, f a fire inspection? Uh, by Littleton Fire and Rescue? I think that's a good idea. Um, and I certainly can add that. Why wouldn't it be an elect our own electrical inspector? Yeah, I was going to make mm -hmm. that same comment. Well, oh, looking um, for an electrical inspection, I believe, is not, not I can go either way. I mean, I, I think the issue is inspection. I was, I, I didn't, I thought fire just by virtue of the fact that the, we're concerned about fire hazard, but if well, the electrical makes more I'm sense. I'm not for sure that a fire <coughs> inspector is going to know uh, the mm -hmm. ins and out of electricity. My thought of when I read this section okay. on electrical was, are we making this so difficult that people are not going to comply with it? They're going to, they're going to do it outside of. Well, I guess my feeling would be I'd err, I, I'm, Fine with making it an electrical inspection. I think, uh, given the nature of the electrical that we're talking about, it's not something that the layman would overtly be able to accomplish, and therefore I think it would warrant some sort of a professional review. And that's my feeling. You know, you, you're going to have. This ordinance was put in the property maintenance code. Was the what? It was put into the property maintenance code. It was not put in the building or put in the residential code because those requirements for electrical or mechanical or anything else are already located in there. Um, I see this more as a enforcement issue, and that's the reason I put it in the property maintenance code. Um, and that with education, um, I think that we can advise potential growers of the hazards of, of some of the electrical issues and extension cords and, and being able to exhaust air out of a grow area so you're not getting people, you know, sick or anything like that and protecting your neighbors so that they don't have those smells all the time. I think th the primary purpose is to educate people saying, this is what we know. 
Yeah. Now, we're not experts on this. Right. I mean. I, I guess just for my own account, we can, you know, however you want to do it, but I guess I would, my request would be that we come, we put some sort of a, an inspection in here because I agree the education is great, but given the health, safety, and welfare issues associated with this stuff, we know in a residential environment the chances are greater than zero that, that people, there could be shortcuts taken. I guess I'd like to have some sort of an so if I, to re, to, just to reiterate uh, Jim's comment about its location in the code, we do not expect people to be coming forward for permits to say, I'm going to be growing in my house. And so what we wanted to, to again, support this is we wanted the ability to come in and have, upon an inspection um, of a violation, to go in there and take it from from an enforcement standpoint, because they're requiring an inspection. We can go in after the fact and say, you need to fix this and bring it up to code, but this does not require them coming in, and they're not going to come in and tell us, hey, we want you to know on, on at City Hall where we've got a grow station in the back. They're going to be doing it on their own, and I think that's why Jim's speaking to to the, the education enforcement side of it. It's, so, it's a different mindset around how people are going to use it. We're not saying you need to come yeah. in. We're saying if you're going to do this, this is what you need to do. No, and I respect that. I, I, I mean, I guess that that's really the philosophical question is, is, you know, what are we seeing in the communities, other communities? What is, is the sense that most people are approaching this from the standpoint of how you guys have laid it out here versus, I, I just go back to one of the presentations that, I think Aurora made up at CML where they, you know, came in and had, uh, you know, showed pictures of a house that was just gone overloaded on this kind of stuff and it was way out of bounds uh, in terms of what the, the building codes and or these types of codes would require. So I don't know what the right answer is. How did you dis make the decision? I mean, what, what research did we engage in to go this direction versus the, uh, an alternate direction? Yeah, I, I think I can at least start with this one and hopefully this will answer your question. There, um, there have been a number of jurisdictions and we did look at what a number of other jurisdictions were doing uh, that are putting restrictions on how you do these inside grows. And I will tell you, I'm just gonna read from the provisions of Amendment 64. The only thing that it says on this issue is that uh, these grows must be in an enclosed, locked space, not conducted openly or publicly, and not made available for sale. So what kind of enclosed locked space? And of course, it's left up to local governments now to determine that. Uh, I, w I will tell you our um, proposed regulations are um, on the strict side, but they're not as strict as some of our neighbors and, and not nearly as strict in some cases. As, as some of our neighbors. Um, so, it, you know, this is gonna be an evolving thing. We've, we've tried to uh, do what we think in, uh, in discussions that we've had between legal and between, uh, and with Jim, uh, come up with something that is reasonable, that is protective of public health and safety, that uh, is not gonna get out of control. And in looking at what other communities are doing, we didn't wanna be sort of out in front and being, you know, wow, Littleton's way past where everybody else is. So. Um, we think we fit within what other communities are doing, stricter than some, not as strict as others. If, if the orientation, though, is education, what's your plan in terms of, of getting the word out to the public that there are certain things they, the people who want to engage in this need to attend to? I mean, how, how, are, you, what, how are you gonna communicate it? You know, my, my ideas were a brochure to start out with um, something in the Littleton report um, that we could put in there about safe ways of safe ways, not safe way, but safe ways of growing marijuana, um, things to look for. Um, I think that that was our initial approach to getting the word out. Um, we, we could, I guess we could hold meetings if, but I'm not an expert and I don't know the right ways and I'm always learning something new about it. Um, but I think, you know, just advising people of the hazards of growing marijuana. You know, we, we, we talked 
during our study session about carbon dioxide and some of the inane things people do in order to get a stronger product. Um, you know, there's other things out there that we have no idea. Well, but, I, and, and it's as we become aware of those things, right. publicizing them and maybe, you know, people won't do these unsafe practices. I, I, and I guess candidly, I mean, I, yeah, I think your point's right, but I, my preference would be to line out a more aggressive communication strategy versus put it out there and just hope that people read it. You know, I can get with Kelly and, and well, I, during... I, because this is, this is an important health, safety, and welfare issue. I mean, you know people are going to start doing this stuff. Yeah, let's, I mean, I also would put it in perspective that if I'm, and I'm no expert either, but we're talking about a natural plant that grows with light and water, and we, what we've done is recommended a limitation of this 100 square feet. And so it's going to be, it's not going to be you or me growing my few plants at home that I can probably do without adding a bunch of whatever, but I can just take care of it and I'm going to grow it because I have a sunlight, a, a skylight in my whatever and I lock the door. Right. I'm growing it. It's going to be the folks who, as Jim indicated, that you know, it's in their basement, they're, and they're probably already violating it now, and they've got a ton of extension cords. It's going to be, it's, it's not going to be, we're not, the drug of, the implications of the drug, I guess I'm saying, are separate from the fact that it's a plant that grows. And so balancing that out and making sure that those that want to follow the law that Littleton has set forth, knows how to do it and has the information through getting on the website because they're I'm pretty sure we could hold a meeting and nobody's going to again come down and go hey right <laughs> no I want to let you know that I'm about to grow no matter how legal it is it still right. has a stigma associated with it so putting that information on the website and making sure that people understand how to do it I mean it, you may remember several months ago the Denver Post had a how to grow marijuana um, article and they told you how to how to grow it which was got a lot of follow up letters because it takes sun and water and it grows. But um, so I, I think it's like really, tomatoes. it's again making sure that people who want to do this um, and want to be legal about it are safe and secure in their home and public right. welfare that we've had. And But part of why we took this approach again is we don't expect this to become some massive grow operation that's here because those that are they're probably already doing it in those locations where they're doing it because that's about intent to sell most likely, not for that personal use because I want a plant or two and I want to have them budding and doing whatever they do. So I, it's that fine balance and none of us know, as Jim has indicated several times, none of us know what this is going to play out and be and we're just going to have to be responsive to the extent that we get a call for an odor um, you know, we're seeing meters that are flying on a constant basis. I mean, the other things that we have known for a long time just from illegal grow operations. Right. And then we go in there and we do appropriate enforcement for the public safe, safety welfare type issues that are there. Okay. So, so. so, if, so if, if, I do, I do want to make one thing clear to you because you did talk about inspections. When our code enforcement team finds a grow. The first thing that they're going to do is bring in the electrical inspector and the mechanical inspector and they're going to be looking at things, making sure that it's safe and it's not a fire hazard and things like that. That That's our first step. You know, so I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, no, I appreciate that. So I have a question about these various things. If you weren't growing marijuana, you were just growing some ivy in your house, or you weren't growing anything, but you had certain kinds of electrical stuff and lighting and mechanical and whatever, would any of this stuff be legal? Oh, yes. So for doing what kinds of things in a house? Well, everything that, that is in this ordinance is completely legal, I mean, as far as requirements, if that's what we're talking about. 
um, Amendment 64 says you can't grow it outside. You yeah, got to yeah. grow it inside, or you can grow it in an accessory structure to <coughs> to a single family home. Um, so as far as using it as an a vine or an ivy, if I'm getting your your question correctly. Um, I'm trying to get at some of these things aren't good, even if you weren't growing marijuana. They're dangerous. Yes. Right? Yes. So it seems to me those things don't need to be mentioned with marijuana because there are already things that people shouldn't be doing, and maybe the code needs to deal with those if we aren't dealing with those adequately. So, but it, I know what we're trying to do, but it seems to me that a lot of this is going to be almost impossible to deal with until after somebody set the the house on fire or you know made it so moldy that nobody can live there or whatever so you know when i was preparing the council communication and the ordinance i did a lot of research online and you can learn a lot of stuff about growing marijuana online Councilman uh, Paul, uh, Jim, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think what you're saying is are some of the things that we're saying are not legal for marijuana, would they be legal now? So, for example, in the lighting section, the use of high-intensity discharge lamps um, are prohibited. I think, Jim will correct me if I'm wrong, that if somebody was using a high-intensity discharge lamp today in their basement to grow some other kind of flower, um, and it wasn't, you know, they had the right electrical box and they were using the right current and didn't have extension cords running all over the place. Technically, that would be legal. It would be foolish. Uh, the person probably wouldn't be doing it. We've probably never had a complaint or a problem about it. But using that kind of light would be legal for some other plant. Because of the research that we've done and the colleagues and other communities that we've talked to, we expect multiple people to consider using these kinds of dangerous lights in a basement to grow marijuana because you can't get natural light in a basement and and this will speed up the process so this is a this is making illegal or prohibiting certain kinds of things that currently would be legal even though foolish if used in other contexts because they're not a problem in other contexts but we expect them to be a problem with respect to marijuana. That's really the, the reason it's in here. Because of the combinations of things. Some in combination, some individually. Jim. And see, that's part of one of the questions I had too, is whenever it talks about um, only LEDs, CFLs, and fluorescent lighting are allowed, and everything else is prohibited, will those three types of lights grow the product? Yes. Or does it take more intense lights to do it? No, I think that um, the reason, you know, yes, they will grow marijuana. Will they do it as effectively as some of the high intensity lamps? I have no idea. But light is needed to grow marijuana. Um, they will provide that. Um, the other thing to remember is that those high intensity lamps use a large amount of electricity. And, and what we're doing is trying to comply with the Energy Conservation Code also by not allowing those. But we don't have a way to monitor. Now, the only that. way we're going to monitor that is when we receive complaints, okay. especially from neighbors who can smell it. I have one other question. Um, on this page, you talk about room size, limited to 100 square feet. If, if you were not going to grow it in the basement, you wanted to do it in one of your bedrooms. Typically, bedrooms are at least 10 by 12. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you got to put in a, a false wall to make it go to 10 by 10 for the 100 square feet? I think what we did is that we looked at how much space was needed to grow six plants. Right. 
and you don't need 100 square feet, but. Yeah, you know, the plants can get six, eight, 10 feet, eight feet tall. That's right. And they can be, be huge. So we gave enough room and we had to come up with a number. I, Jim, I think this is, you, you may be thinking about the limiting is, is that the growing would be confined to no more than 100 square feet is the way I read the code suggestion. But, but my, Phil, the point is, if it's in a 10 by 12 room, does that make it illegal? Because it's, in, it's two feet, it's 120 square feet and not 100 square feet. Well, it would be how much of the room are you using for the growth? But that's, you're right, Jim. No. You're yeah. not going to be able to sh go in you there have, and, and it has shear to be it fully enclosed. Two feet. Okay. Fully so we, enclosed we can clear this up pretty quickly here. Yes. Okay. So you, you can have it in any large, you can have it in any room. You just can't exceed the use of that room space of growing it beyond 100 square feet. So we could have it in here but in it could 100 be, yes, square exactly. feet. Yes, exactly. It could be in this room. Not, Right, and it's lockable. But you can only get 100 square feet of it. And that part of that was limiting the amount, so that's regardless of no, the number of adults, residents that live in that home. Part of that was limiting, so you don't get six people living in a home at six plants and having 36 plants, and all of a sudden you've got this expansion, but saying we're gonna, we're gonna in a residential area, we're gonna give you 100 square feet to grow, since however all, much you can grow. Since all of us are so used to growing marijuana amount, and consuming it. Just pretend can, it's tomatoes. So just help me with this. If if a person's going to grow this to consume for him or herself, how how many plants would they need if just for their own consumption? Well, they can have six. So hmm? you need six. Pardon? <laughs> you can Which only no have so by law they are allowed six. No. <laughs> yeah, I don't think then any of us can answer how much law. somebody needs and a lot of that is personal habits. The, well, law no, allowed, I mean, just the, law, the law allows for six and no more than three flowering at any one time. And I couldn't tell you what it so means to the, be flowering. It's sort of the cycling the, through the flowering that right. affects this, right? Okay, Jerry. Okay. <clears throat> so, so right now, today, I, I am, I'm sure there are people growing marijuana now in their homes. Mm -hmm. Are we having fires, lots of fires, or is, is it an epidemic out there with, when, when the, the fire guys show up, they find out that it was because somebody was growing marijuana in their home? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So, but we're thinking that could happen at this point. I think that that. So when your guys go into a home and they see that somebody is using, overloading a circuit or using inadequate extension cords, do you ignore that today? Would we ignore that today? Absolutely not. Even if, even if you're talking about extension cords, not even associated with, with marijuana, but associated with anything else. Right. Well, I guess the point I'm getting to here is if, if that's what you do today, now we're trying because it's marijuana, so now we've got to make more laws on this. I, I, I think you're right about making sure people are aware about overloading circuits, whether they're growing marijuana, uh, daffodils, or mm -hmm. just like to have a space heater on. That, 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 again, seems what we should be providing information to folks on uh, instead of getting all scared that people are going to be burning their houses down. Councilmember Valdez, th this, you, you are identifying an absolutely valid policy decision for the city council to make. We can't tell you that we have had these problems and houses burning down in Littleton. We can tell you that our colleagues around the metro area have had these experiences. And we can tell you that just about other, every other community is looking at what kind of restrictions do we need to add to our codes to protect against these kinds of things or minimize the risk that we may be seeing more of these kinds of problems. If the council decides that until we start seeing these problems in Littleton, we are comfortable protecting the public with the code that we have now um, without any of these limitations, that, that's a policy decision that you all can make. Um, we, we are moving forward with this based upon prior discussions with the council about what the plan would be for how Littleton is going to implement Amendment 64, and that's why we're here tonight talking about this. Right, but I think what you just said is that it's not happening here, but it is happening other places. Then, then bring me a list, and let's, let's see how bad is it happening other places. Well, well but I would clarify, though, that 
when we're talking about it happening other places, it's not happening under, at least correct me if I'm wrong, it's not happening under or since 64. Right, it goes, since, it's since it's, medical marijuana. Yeah, right. it's, it's since grows have started happening and people have been plugging in and it's been, and the medical marijuana grow is a different mm -hmm. animal than, than the personal grow situation. That just started, what, two months ago, three months ago. And so there is no real life experience. I mean, definitely hear your point in here. Right. It's it's these larger grow operations where you're selling to other entities. And we don't. We're not going to allow those in the city anyway. Well, even but but currently under the medical, you're selling. I can grow and then sell to the medical environment. And so I'm trying to cram in my grows because I've got X number of patients and I get. I can't remember the number of plants. But we just none of us have the experience relative to the home grows. And as Ken pointed out, it will, you know, it can sit on the shelf until such time. That right. I, I guess what I've been hearing, though, in the discussion tonight with Mr. Thielen, though, is that it's danger to grow it because of people overloading their circuits and stuff. So if we go in and see that, we're going to send in our electrical engineers and everybody else in there or, or inspectors in there. Uh, but if we do that already today, I mean, what well, is it? Again, I, I, I think it's our reaction because this is marijuana that we just got to we got to do something about it because it's marijuana. When we're already doing something today along this line, this, this proposed ordinance pulls out a specific con potential concern and identifies five or six specific areas that we want to communicate to the public around how you. Great. Make that yeah, we, we should be doing that anyway. It sounds like. Well, it's. It's calling it out specifically relative to the grow of marijuana, and, and that is, as Ken pointed out, the policy question. Thank and you. That's all you bet. Yeah. Phil. Uh, two questions, Jim. I'm not sure we can entirely deal with them, but what I'd like to see is some alternative way to deal with the high-intensity lamps so that it is more generally practical uh, and can be stated in some way that may be less specific to the marijuana grow. Uh, that states, you know, based on whatever load capacity uh, a home or a residence might have, um, what they might be able to have or not have, uh, rather than just an outright saying in conjunction with a grow, you can't use a high, high intensity lamp. That would be just be something I would be looking for. Uh, second, um, the prohibition within a, a multifamily uh, residence unit. Um, defining what multifamily means, is it like a, a duplex or not? And then um, are we looking to make a distinction between a personal grow um, for adult use versus a personal grow for medical marijuana? And are we putting some constrictions on that? And might there be some different way to treat that, um, possibly limiting the amount of space or that might be available within a, a multifamily unit rather than just a, a straight prohibition uh, for any kind of multifamily. The issue with multifamily and the reason that we <clears throat> looked at that closely, um, not only is the, the, the electrical fire hazard, you know, which, you know, is, is an issue, um, the odors, are the issue also. Um, the odors from growing marijuana <clears throat> are very intense, uh, very distinctive and overpowering, um, where that you have to exhaust it out of the grow area. Um, but when you exhaust it, you have to filter it so those smells you know, aren't disturbing the neighborhood or your or your your next door neighbor, stuff like that. Um, it might be difficult to, to accomplish that in in um, a multifamily unit. Um, well, I, I guess where I'm coming at is if they were able to deal with those issues, right? Um, you know, what is if are there other specific items? And you know, one of the things is we could state that, but uh, uh, we can also allow the building property owner uh, to you know, put some constraints or not uh, upon what they may allow in their, in their building uh, in a multifamily situation, and that might be a better way than necessarily the city coming down 
on something like that. So I'd, I'd like to see or hear okay. some alternatives. Bruce? I'm glad we're having this discussion because I think it's, it's valid to how to interpret this. And, and I don't think any of us have enough experience in this, however, in my limited experience, when someone was growing six or less plants, there were no abundance of extension cords. There wasn't a high intensity discharge lamp. There was rather something similar to growing parsley or tomatoes, quite honestly, in, in, in a house. When somebody exceeded six plants, it started to get into hydroponics. It got into water supplies, exchanging water, bringing in electricity, heated, heated rooms, certain humidities, et cetera, and then you started to have to exhaust them. They didn't, and but it was because it was more than six plants. I think we've already said you can't cultivate marijuana in Littleton. So if you walk in and there's more than six plants, there's an issue. And probably if they are cultivating, it's a grow house, and it has all those things that we're concerned about, and we should be. But if it's less than six, it's a hobby. It's, it's, it's probably less than our concerns. And somehow we need to express that because it, it, we have to have clarity. Again, we're, we're, the, the voters' intent was the, the constitutional acceptance of small amounts of personal grows. And uh, we have to fulfill our sense of not over trying to over-regulate something which, keeping it simple, we wouldn't do. We're, we're, yes. You know, we'd look at the worst case scenario, what could happen, and I kind of defer a question, is it six, per, six plants per person, yeah. or is it six plants per household? It's six person per person. So that those six plants can multiply very quickly with a husband and wife and so forth. But that's, yes. the, so just for clarification, that's why we had the 100 square feet limitation. There is not a limit. If six people live in the house, they could have without 36 the limitation plants. of the square footage, you could have 36 plants. As Ken pointed out, three of them flowering, which is a nuance, if you will. But we've limited the space based mm -hmm. upon that 100 square feet. And so you can grow whatever you can grow within that six plants per person within that 100 square feet. But you could have a house that has five rooms, 100 square feet each, growing stuff. This doesn't say per house, it just says a room. I think it says per structure, council member Cole. Detached single in the family. dwelling yeah. unit. Limit, it says it's limited to 100 square feet in a um, detached single family dwelling or accessory unit. So there, it might want to tighten up that, that language. That second part of 901.2 talks about um, you know, regardless of the number of qualified patients or caregivers or persons otherwise allowed to cultivate and residing in the dwelling unit. So, but is the dwelling unit the house or... It, it yeah, says, it's I guess the way I would look at it, and, and if, if I think it's pretty clear, cultivation of marijuana in a structure shall be limited to 100 square feet. 100 square feet in a structure, whether that structure is a one-room structure or a 25-room structure, you've got 100 square feet. And I would also go back to 901.1, which speaks to in a de detached single-family dwelling or an accessory structure. So, I mean, I think we're into nuances now. Right. Going back to the larger policy question of does council wish to um, implement this code in advance of concerns, or shall we sit back and use the existing um, code enforcement approach? Any other questions, Jim? Did you? No. Um, you know, this is all brand new. We we've not dealt with it before. We have dealt with illegal grows. We have had um, houses that have had to be nearly destroyed because of illegal grows. Um, there has been houses burned down. There was just a house in Douglas County not that long ago that burned down because of a grow. 
And I think, you know, it was interesting to me when you said that there's tougher laws and lesser laws, and we're somewhere in the middle. I'm more on the side of having a more, t a tougher law and setting a higher bar for this type of thing. This is, this is, the intent of this is intended so that people can have a, you know, a less expensive supply in their home. It isn't intended for anything other than that. There are people that live in front of them, behind them, next door to them, and they are, regardless of, of what we think, there's a, a higher level of being of those neighbors being affected by one neighbor having a grow in their home than not. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that it's incumbent upon us to make safe and protect all of the citizens, those that decide that they do want to grow and may not have the um, correct way of doing it, and then those that don't want to grow but have a neighbor who does. So... I don't think we're I don't think we're making it any more difficult for them. We're making it safe, and um, I would be interested to see what's what. And it could just be a little one page, just or a brief summary of what some of the places are doing that are making it tougher. Um, because I think one of the things that we need to think about with this new crop that uh, has joined our community is that it's easier to start off with this stuff at the highest level and the most, putting the most um, restrictions on it. And then as we see that they may be too tight of restrictions or that it's easier to let those, to loosen those up than it is to do the reverse of that. So I'd like to see some of the, what some of the other cities are doing. I don't need a big long detail of it, but some of the okay. things that are a little bit tighter than that. Um, and I have to say, when when we put medical marijuana in and I toured these facilities, I was over at one of the facilities, I won't mention the names, and they were growing in the basement, and it was frightening. The ground was wet from the water. There were about a 1,000 extension cords running around. There were lights hanging. There were plants growing into the lights where they were burnt. The leaves were getting singed from it. It was a very scary place, and, the, and it was so pungent that it was, you almost couldn't, your eyes are starting to water being in there. So and that is, is, in, is in Littleton. And so I think that there, there's no doubt about it that there could be. And I would, just start, I would just interject that those, are gonna, those violations in the residential world are going to happen outside of this ordinance. We're saying mm -hmm. if you want to grow within that 10 by 10 feet, I mean, that's a small little area. Um, here's how we recommend that you do it in a safe fashion. The people who are, are violating it, to Councilman Valdez's, I think, concern, they're already violating it, and they've mm -hmm. probably been violating it for years because they're selling on the black market, they just like to smoke a lot of it, whatever that is. And we're, we're basically providing guidelines, if you will, saying here's the things that you need to be concerned about, back to Councilman Stallman's earlier um, questions. If you're going to do this and you know nothing about it, here's what you can and can't do within Littleton in these kind of broad parameters, those six areas again for it. So, and, and we don't expect people to be coming forward. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's one of the things to keep in mind. These are going to be complaint-based issues, and we're going to go in there, and if we see, and granted, those are in a, in a more commercial realm, but if we see that in the residential arena, um, we already have the code requirements in place allowing us to deal with, you know, the electrical code and unsafe situations and all. So um, we expect those that are in, in conformance with Amendment 64 to grow their six plants and we will never see them. We will never know they're here. They probably won't do any of this, um, but they'll at least have that information should you approve it and they'll probably grow it like they grow their parsley and tomatoes or whatever they, they grow. It's, as I said earlier, it's a plant, so. Um, does it, brewing beer take a lot of electricity? Uh, I, I, I drink it, I don't make it. Dirt? I'm sorry, does? Brewing beer. Oh. Does that take a lot of electricity? Not that I'm aware of. You don't you just do put everything out. in a big 
copper kettle and put a lid on it and some sugar and some then water. Then they can catch, <laughs> catch on fire and have a house fire. Oh my God, let's have a law. Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay. Um, let's see, do we, did, do we have a motion on this, Wendy? No, ma'am. Okay, <laughs> council, are you ready to? Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Are you ready to, is somebody ready to make a motion? I move that the ordinance amending Title IV, Chapter 1, Section 5 of the City Code regulating residential marijuana be approved on first reading in the public hearing set for November 5, 2013 at 7 p.m. in the Council Chamber. Second. Motion and a second. Ready to vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries. Okay, 10C is an ordinance on first reading establishing a stormwater flood management utility enterprise. I'll read the ordinance. This is an ordinance of the City of Littleton, Colorado, establishing the City of Littleton Stormwater and Flood Management Utility Enterprise under the provisions of Title 37, Article 45.1, Colorado Revised Statutes. And uh, a note, staff has asked that in order to have consistency in the naming that we call this the Stormwater and Flood Management Utility Fund. And so on your ordinance under Section 7, where on line 13, where it reads Storm Utility Revenue Fund, that would change to Stormwater and Flood Management Utility Fund. The Revenue Fund. Stormwater and Flood Management Utility Fund. The language that's in the That is the language that was given to me by the city attorney. That is what they're asking, that that be called in order to have consistency. Do you guys have additional questions on that? Okay, is there any discussion? Okay, I need a motion. Madam Chairman, I move the proposed ordinance establishing a stormwater and flood management utility fund. Did I get that correct? Uh, and the enterprise of the city of Littleton be approved on first reading and the public hearing be set for November 5, 2013 at 7 p.m. in the council chamber. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ready to vote? The vote is unanimous, the motion carries. Okay. Item 10D. This is an ordinance approving a second amendment to the lease with Stanton Dodge for Winnetka Ponds Barn. I'll read that ordinance. An ordinance of the City of Littleton, Colorado, authorizing the second amendment to the lease agreement dated October 17, 2003, with our Stanton Dodge for the Winnetka Ponds Barn. Council, any questions? I do. Jim? I guess I want to know why the city continues to own this barn. <laughs> uh, it is close to the house. The public perceives it belongs to the house. Uh, Stanton put several thousand dollars into the reconstruction of that barn to keep it from falling down. Um, and I don't see why the city owns a barn that is so close to the house that everybody thinks it belongs to the house. That we either trade some land with South Suburban so that they own the barn and can sell it to Stanton and we can share in the revenue of that or we put it to the voters to sell that barn to Stanton for its appraised value. Well, let me answer your question to begin with. The reason we own it is it's on our property. That's correct. So let's trade the property or let's get rid of it. I don't think the city has any business owning that barn. That's a decision of the council. I don't think that was a question for staff. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to make an amendment? I guess I am just putting it out there that somebody ought to do something about this in the next two years. <laughs> does, he, so, does Stanton want we, to buy we, it? We stand by your direction, so <laughs> provide us. I, At it, one it, time, Stanton know. did want to buy it in my conversation with him, but it's been some time ago. Do you wish for us to approach him and see if he's interested in acquiring it? It would take some steps, as Councilman Taylor has addressed, but I have not talked to Mr. Dodge about buying the barn, just leasing it. I would, I would suggest that we allow Charlie to do that. 
there are a number of things that's got to happen. We can't sell the barn to Stanton as a city without going to the voters to do so because it's on public land. So we either have to go to the voters and ask permission to do that, or we have to trade the land with South Suburban. They own a land adjoining this, and then let them sell it, and we can share in the profits. We would probably okay. also have to do an appraisal of the barn and the property so that it sits on. Then the question becomes, if, if we vote this, rent, this lease rental thing down, and then direct staff to... So Work so, on. so I would recommend that you approve the lease, okay? Um, so that we have a valid lease for for that, and because it could take some time, and I would ask that council not. I mean, there's questions about the process of the acquisition of the land. We're meeting with Mr. Dodge on other issues, so we can add this to those conversations um, separate from that. But I would move forward to adopt the lease so that the that continued. Lease can, is in place, and then obviously, as part of a, any future sale, that lease would go away. Can we, um, and we can shorten the over. length of the lease? It goes the, on here. It's asking for it to go to 2023. If if a sale comes about, that will take care of itself. Okay. Yeah. It'll that the lease yeah, will I just think go we, away. We can terminate the lease. Yeah. What Councilman Taylor is asking is outside of the of the policy question before you tonight. We need to at at. Mr. Dodge's request deal with this lease. If council further wants the direct staff to engage in the potential sale of the property, Mr. Dodge is one potential sale of that property, but it's the question of disposition of the property. And there are other variables that um, Mr. Dodge may want to take into account and participate in relative to the property that he owns. Okay but suffice to say there's other negotiations in place. And yet, Phil. Uh, yes, uh, Charlie, within the lease agreement, without me having to go through it with a fine tooth, um, if uh, Stanton sells the property, his, the residential property, um, does the lease continue with the property owner, uh, the base property I'm talking about, or does he have an ability to sever it? Well, there is a termination clause in here, but I would assume that it goes with the land. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's an assignment in there, but I can review it and, and follow up with you. This is um, first reading, so I can have that information for you. Thank you. Okay, We've discussed that with Mr. Dodge. He has not indicated any interest at this point in selling the property. He does have a renter that's using the house. I understand. Any other questions? Need a motion. I move the ordinance extending the lease for the city-owned barn at Winnetka Ponds be approved on first reading and a public hearing be scheduled for November 5, 2013 at 7 p.m. in the council chamber. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Amendment. Okay. I'd like to make a, I'd like to uh, amend it to, uh, to the period of performance to be for 12 months. Do we, have um, a, do we have a second? Okay, dies for lack of a second. Was there no second? No. No right. second. Okay. okay, back to the original motion. Ready to vote? Oh, there you went again. Yeah. The vote is six <laughs> in favor with Councilmember Valdez voting no. The motion carries. I must be going on vacation, grumpy boy. <laughs> 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 Okay, ordinance 10 or item 10 E. This is an ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of the City of Littleton, Colorado Mental Health Facilities Development Revenue Bond Series 2013 ADMHN project in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $9,900,000 to finance and refinance certain health care facilities, authorizing the execution and delivery by the city of a finance agree financing agreement and such bond and closing documents in connection therewith making determinations as to the sufficiency of revenues and as to other matters related to the project ratifying action heretofore taken and relating to such bond providing other matters relating hereto, thereto. Sheesh. 
So okay. <laughs> Council, any discussion? Jim? Doug? Yes, I, the question is, in my reading this staff report, the, they're requesting something less than a million dollars to refinance, and yet this ordinance is allowing it up to 9.9 .9 million. They are refinancing two previous debt obligations which are approximately $9 million, and then $709,000 would be for new capital improvements. Okay, so in reading your communication, I did not pick that up at all. The well, only figures that's in there is at 709000 Okay, I apologize. We will have uh, more specific information on the second reading, but that when you read the ordinance, uh, those uh, items are spelled out under on page two, but I, I will clarify that for second reading. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Bruce? Doug, the, are they refinancing properties or issues or items or capital that is in within the city limits or is it spread beyond the city limits? Um, let me direct that question to some of the representatives from the mental health network. I think they can better answer that. I'm Michael Ellis, the CFO at Arapahoe Douglas Mental Health Network. Uh, thank you for doing this. Basically what this is, it's uh, seven properties that are a collateral pool for this. And at the end of the day, it's going to be about a 60-40 loan to value. So um, that's what is backing up this bond issue, for one. And also our revenue streams, of course. But uh, all the properties except for one, is within the city limits of Littleton. Does thank that you. answer your question? It does, thank you. Other questions? And yeah. I'll just say that under the terms of, of this type of financing, it doesn't make a difference whether it's within or without of the city. Yeah, I, I, I think my, my bottom line was uh, Rappo Douglas Mental Health is a tremendous neighbor and, and someone who we work with quite regularly in the city. And it just adds more in my mind that we're willing to do this because it's something that we're directly benefiting from. Thank you. Yes, um, we're, we're, we certainly feel like we're a partner of the city. We have many facilities here. So uh, this really does facilitate us to do our mission. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I need a motion. Madam Chairman, I move that the proposed ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale of the City of Littleton, Colorado Revenue Bond, Arapaho Douglas Mental Health Network Project, Series 2013, in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $9.9 .9 million to finance and refinance certain health care facilities, authorizing the execution and delivery by the city of a financing agreement and such bond and closing documents in connection therewith, making determinations as to the sufficiency of revenues and as to other matters related to the project, ratifying action herewith taken and relating to such bond, providing other matters relating thereto be approved on first reading and the public hearing be set for November 5, 2013 at 7 p.m. in the council chamber. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. Vote. The vote is unanimous. The motion carries. Okay. So, uh, on to report, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, wanted to uh, let you know one thing. Well, we have ordered a new uh, timer, um, so it should be here in about uh, 10 to 14 days, and we'll get it installed. You have your lights on still. Um, there's a light on in the parking lot. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, we'll get that in. As the Charter Review Committee was mentioned earlier today, the, um, the reason for that in the minutes and the staff notes are now online, and we will be updating those. <coughs> if you go to City Council and then click on Charter Review Committee, it has its own uh, web page now. So that's moving forward. And... The uh, South Metro Fire Rescue Authority. So the Charter Review Committee has its own website? Yeah, well, web page. Web page. Yeah, web page, yeah. So if you click on City Council and under City Council, you'll see Charter Review Committee. 
and then you can scroll down and see the documents and the minutes from that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, then the South Metro Fire Rescue Authority Council is aware um, a preliminary uh, phase one or part one, I guess, um, study has come out and the fire partners will probably be meeting on that um, sometime in November. Uh, Inglewood does not anticipate their council talking about it until January and I would expect that we will be in that same phase and we may have a joint study session with them depending upon how the the um, management team, I can't remember what we call our, um, the review, re the review yeah. of that, how that plays out in terms of us um, talking amongst ourselves and then ultimately with the um, with Inglewood and to some extent with South Metro, but we are moving forward uh, with the posting for our, our replacement fire chief to replace uh, Chief John Mullen. Um, so that process is in place in anticipation of anything that we may or may not do being much more in the long term. There's a lot of questions. I know council has probably had a chance to review it, but it's very general in its nature. I think they covered um, a good uh, their cross-section of their review was good. The details for us to actually do a comprehensive analysis are fairly limiting in that, and so I'd anticipate that we will be collecting a fair amount of questions to go back to them on uh, first quarter next year. So um, just didn't want that sitting out there. I wanted you to know that at some point we'll meet with the partners, and uh, we want to match Inglewood's uh, review as well. And I believe that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Backman. A couple things, a couple announcements. I want to remind everyone who it might have an interest, the Littleton Community Retreat is coming up this Friday and Saturday, October 18th and 19th. You can go to littletoncommunityretreat.org. That's all one word, littletoncommunityretreat.org, and register online, and there's other contact information there. Uh, this will be a, uh, a retreat of community leaders to talk about Issues involving the health of the community is the broad overriding uh, topic for the conference. The other is that the South Metro Denver Chamber has announced their business expo for 2013 on Thursday, October 24th from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., basically all day long at the Denver Marriott DTC. And this will be uh, an opportunity to see presentations and contact people from some of the businesses that are involved in the South Metro area, as well as attend some seminars. And that information is at www.bestchamber, all one word, dot com. And uh, the uh, events are free and open to the public. Bill. Yes, and just a, a footnote on that. Uh, it begins at 7 a.m. with an open board meeting of the South Metro Denver, Denver Chamber of Commerce. Uh, folks may recall that uh, Scott Ranville and Jenny uh, uh, are uh, putting together a Denver Metro City Design Competition. Uh, if anyone's interested, he's giving me a quick update on the folks that have registered uh, for the competition, and uh, we do have a commitment to uh, view the winners after the competition early in 2014. Uh, did attend the RTD um, local government interface and um, they had uh, a lot of learnings that were presented between the ULI RTD and uh, old Arvada uh, or the Arvada station uh, work and so that part was, uh, was pretty interesting uh, to see. And then last week we, in our tour, we were given the Littleton Museum collection policy and some of the uh, recommendations or thoughts from the uh, museum committee and um, I didn't know if we had that scheduled out for consideration. So, do we have it? Is, is that something? The recommendations for the collections policy, do we need to take an action or have a discussion of that? I, th I think if you want to at some, day, at some point, I can follow up with Tim, but validate or, or the recommendation from the yes. museum board, I think that'd be appropriate. Yep. Please. Jerry. Cool. Uh, and thank you for the tour the other day, of, or the night of the uh, behind the scenes of the museum. That was pretty cool. Uh, and as I look at my notes, uh, uh, Mr. Penny, it, you were going to look at a crosswalk or some sort of a way to get across Littleton Boulevard between Bannock and 
I think it was a Detura, where there is, mm -hmm. it's a huge gap there. Yep. If you can, just keep that on your charts. Okay. So I'll ask yep. you from time to time. Okay. And I just thought about tonight here. Great. And also, I will not be here Tuesday for our meeting. So, come. Or Thursday. Because we have the legislators Thursday. Are, are we having a meeting on Tuesday, next Tuesday? Okay. We have a study yes. session, yes. yes. Okay. That's the one with the South Suburban. Right. Okay, yeah, that's right. Bruce. Just a reminder that the Harvest Festival at the museum is this Saturday. I believe it's 10 to 2, if memory serves, or 10 no, to 3. No, no, no. That was last Saturday. Was no, that was craft fair. No, that was the Harvest Festival. That was, two weeks, that was a week and a half ago. The library festival. Time is flying when you're Well, if you missed it, then you'll oh, be early for next year, and you should attend accordingly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've been late all week, right? <laughs> How was it? How's that grow going in that 100 square feet? <laughs> <laughs> they had a record attendance. Excellent. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Jim, <laughs> um, I w was at the Denver South Economic Development Partnership meeting, and they had two speakers there. One was Kim Day, who is the uh, associated with Den uh, Denver International Airport, and she talked about they had 53 million passengers go through that airport. Uh, it's a, a lot of people. Then uh, also speaking was, was Robert Al. Oslis Loggers. Oles Logger. Oles Logger. Oles Logger. I mess that up every time I try to pronounce it. But um, they are number two. He's at Centennial Airport. Uh, they are number two in business landings and general airport landings. Um, so both those airports are just very busy. DIA is, is fifth busiest in the United States and 13th busiest in the world. The C-470 Corridor Coalition um, had a report on ramp funding. We are, we had requested $200 million for ramp funding, and they awarded us the largest award that they were doing at $100 million. So because the project is scalable, uh, we'll be cutting back, uh, instead of having two lanes express toll each direction, will probably be a single lane um, with some weaving lanes so that you can move in and out when you get close to intersections. Uh, that will, uh, that's still moving forward. Decisions will be made uh, probably within the next year. They are needing matching funds uh, to get this completed and that will be an ongoing discussion. Um, last week there was a Sustainable Communities Initiative uh, full consortium meeting at Inglewood. Uh, it's the four and a half million dollar HUD grant that was received by Dr. Cog. It was matched by seven and a half million dollars of uh, community partners, and it was all these community partners that were were there. Uh, Peggy was was attendance at, at the at the meeting. And earlier tonight, we, the subject came up about events and downtown Littleton has a lot of events but I tell you I, I am downtown a lot and talking to merchants a lot and it is frequently said because it is specifically noticed that there is a lack of other city personnel who attend these events and this is the turkey leg and wine hoedown the uh, zombie crawl and pig roast, the pumpkin follies and, and goat show. Um, those are really good, great community events. But it is particularly noticed and commented upon to me that city personnel is just never in attendance. And if we're going to do event planning that we want to do something with the Downtown Merchants Association, I think that's going to have to change, and that's an editorial on my part. That's Peggy. it. Peggy? Well, tough act to follow there. Um, I want to thank all the volunteers who helped with that uh, Museum Harvest Festival on Saturday. The record that was set was 12,603 people, which was 2,200 more than the record in 2010, so it was crowded. Um, the library craft fair is this Saturday starting at noon. That helps. Um, Jim mentioned um, the Sustainable Communities Initiative. And then um, 
something related to our tour last week. Um, we toured the library and museum. We learned about potential plans to um, rent rooms at the museum to help generate some revenue. Um, but as we consider that, Michael, as we consider that, I would like council to develop a policy governing use of rooms in all city buildings, particularly the free use by citizens. Do we have a, I think we should have a policy on that. Is it a first come first serve basis or do we ever charge fees? Um, is it for citizen? I mean, for citizen groups, local le legislators, you know, whoever, so that we. I believe we do have a policy on the use of the public rooms. Do we? So, so is that yep. is that on? So I, can we put I, that on the website then? Yeah, I could follow up with Kelly, but okay. yeah, there's an adopted policy. Because people have asked me about it, um, so it, okay. we just yep. want to make sure we've got people in the know. Got it. Yep. So. Um, and that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, council will be now um, going into an exec. Bruce, do you wanna read no. the? I move council convene an, exec an executive session pursuant to Colorado revised statute section 24-6-402, sub four, sub B, and Colorado revised statute section 24-6-402, sub four, sub F, for the purpose of receiving legal advice and discussing personnel matters concerning the city manager, in attendance will be all city council, city manager Penny, city attorney Fellman, and outside council Tammy Tanui from SIRSA. Hey, um, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, would you, would you amend your motion to also state that at the conclusion of the executive session, the council meeting will be adjourned, the council will conduct no other business tonight? So moved. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second, ready to vote. The vote is unanimous, the motion carries. Is, it, is that normally in your statement? No, but that's good to put it in there. Yeah, no. Just, I thought yeah.